Certainly, and I I don't see Mr. Williams, but since you said he's here, I'll Present. call him first. But there he is. Excellent. Uh, Miss Wells. Here. Miss Langallis. Here. Miss Jordan Byron. Present. Mr. Cantor. Here. Mr. Mushak. Here. Mr. Rowena. Here. Mr. Bryce. Present. And I think Mr. Pachas is on, but not on camera. Yes, I am here. Okay. And Mr. Shulman. Here. Okay. Okay. Um, with, uh, with that, uh, we have um, one uh, seat uh, available. And um, as uh, the uh, senior member for, uh, for uh, this first item, uh, I'm going to seat Mr. Uh, Pachas um, and for the following uh, uh, item B, uh, I'll uh, seat, seat Mr. Bryce and uh, unseat Mr. Pachas. Um, with that, uh, this is review and action uh, on uh, applications. Uh, and uh, this is 2023-33 uh, LM uh, John Hallen. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. 330 Connecticut Avenue, District 5, Block 67, uh, Lot 2, live music request for Rio Border Cafe. And is there someone here representing uh, the cafe? I don't believe so, Mr. Chairman. I don't see anybody raising their hand. All right. List or the other. Um, well, we have two options. We can uh, table this or we can move on it. Um, uh, I visited the site. Um, there really uh, is uh, no housing that I saw uh, anywhere in the area. It's all uh, commercial uh, strip. Um, it, it doesn't seem to me that if they're uh, a sound test uh, is in order. Um, I personally didn't see any reason uh, not to approve this. Uh, other comments from the uh, commissioners? I would agree with you, Lou. Well, there, there, there are houses on the other side on Scribner. Uh, do, as, as I saw it, uh, I don't think those houses backed up to it. No, they don't abut it, and right. they're not adjacent, but they are in the area. Right. Yeah. That that that, that that's correct. Uh, but they're and, really pretty remote from it. Uh, you know, but if they're, if they're playing music, um, like on on a weekend, it can interrupt your quiet enjoyment. Yeah, but in that neighborhood, there isn't a lot of quiet enjoyment. <laughs> very busy okay. I just you know. Um, is this just a permit for in, internal live music? Is that right? Not external? That, that, that was my uh, understanding. Uh, there, there appears to be no uh, outdoor seating uh, at that location. It appeared to be uh, internal. Okay, well, so what's changing? Because they currently already have indoor music. Um, I, for one, was not uh, aware of that. Is uh, it live music, JJ? Yeah, back in the bar area. Has, has, has no one eaten there before? It's delicious food. Oh, the mariachi group yeah. is fabulous. I uh, have to put my clothes there. This isn't your room, Ricky said. What? Please, go ahead. Anyway, I was going to say they have mariachi there. And they've entertained me many times, including on my yes. birthday. So, uh, yeah, it's quite fabulous and doesn't go outside the building. So what's changing? I think they're just getting a permit to make it legal. There may there may be a uh, difference between a couple guy mariachi guys and then a formal band, which is required in the liquor permit, which is quite mm. possible. It also looks from this document that the sound recordings were 
louder near the street than they were outside the door, if I read this document correctly. Um, mm -hmm. I wish the applicant was here to clarify that, but if I read that correctly, it sounds like the traffic going by was louder than the measurement at the door. I think what isn't the property the black roof on the to the right. I think we have the wrong property circled. It's in the next to TJ Maxx, not next to Shoprite. Sorry, three sixty, right? Roof. That's right. Okay, just want to make sure. I like I thought I read it correctly, and I'm like, well, that's not on that property. What what's it? it isn't it three sixty Connecticut Avenue? Uh, uh, three thirty. Uh, 3.30, sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, the, the 3.30 is the address for that entire complex. It's the little black extension on the end there. All right, yeah, right there. Right there. Yeah. Well, I think we should approve it. All right, uh, is, that, is that a motion? Um, yeah, I'll move to approve it. Okay, is there a second? Okay. Ken. Any, uh, any uh, discussion? I'll, I'll have my margarita with salt, please. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, if there's no discussion, let's, uh, let's go to a vote. Um, uh, we can't do this with a hand raised. Steve, you want to do a roll call? Sure. And, and I'm just confirming you're voting on the resolution that's up on, on the screen. We're voting on the uh, <clears throat> resolution on the uh, screen. And uh, this is, um, I'm asking for affirmative votes at this point. Okay. So I'll start with who I can't see. Um, Mr. Williams? President, yeah, me, yes. Mr. Pachas? Yes. Ms. Langallis? Yes. Ms. Wells? Yes. Mr. Mushak? Yes. Mr. Rowena? Yes. Mr. Cantor? Yes. Ms. Jordan Byron? Yes. Mr. Shulman? I think I got everybody. Uh, yes. Okay. So it's, it's unanimous. unanimous um, We'll move on to uh, uh, the second item. And uh, for this one, Mr. Bryce uh, will be seated. Um, and that is 2023-25 uh, SP, a modification, Silvermine Crossing uh, Condominium Association 123, Old Belden Hill Road. This is a request to modify their special permit 14-81 to add a generator and propane tanks uh, on the site. Um, and I saw there were some representatives from 123. Uh, so uh, would you like to tell us about that? Hi, yes, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Good evening, my name is attorney Megan Kirby from Zeldis, Needle and Cooper. Um, our law firm represents the Silvermine Crossing Condominium Association, which governs the Silvermine Crossing condo complex located at 123 Old Belden Hill Road. Um, the association's president, Glenn Groglio, is also in attendance at this meeting with me tonight. Um, the association has submitted this request to modify the previously approved site plan to place a generator and two propane tanks. Oh, there's Glenn. Um, on the island located in the middle of the Silvermine Crossing condominium complex parking lot, um, as well as to landscape, re-landscape the entire island. Um, the reason that they're seeking this modification is because over the past several years, Silvermine Crossing has experienced upwards of 10 separate power outages that have caused the complex's sewage pump to fail. Once the sewage pump fails, unfortunately, many unit owners experience backups and failures with respect to their sewage to their individual units. And in some cases, uh, unit owners have experienced floods to their basements. Uh, accordingly, Silvermine Crossing has been uh, required to expend upwards of five to $20,000 per power outage to remediate the issue. 
And accordingly, the association is uh, interested in installing a backup generator as sort of a backup uh, power source in the event that the complex loses uh, power. It also intends to place two propane tanks near the generator that will be used uh, once the current, or I guess the first uh, propane source for the generator runs out. Um, additionally, uh, the association also plans to have placed in total seven concrete column bollards uh, around the generator and tanks. It recently obtained a quote um, specifically on May 26, 2023 from a landscaping company for the placement of those bollards, uh, which we would be more than happy to provide to the commission if needed. Um, that was not uh, initially included in our uh, the materials that we did submit. With respect to the landscaping portion, the association additionally uh, intends to use this opportunity to re-landscape re re the entire parking lot island, um, first to screen the generator tanks and bollards, and generally speaking, to improve the landscape of the entire parking lot island. Um, the association plans to plant numerous four to five foot emerald green trees, um, arborvitae around the generator tanks and bollards, and that way it would conceal them and also aesthetically improve that portion of the island. It also would remove dead plant material, stumps, plants, and trees, and plant various new trees and flowers across the island, therefore uh, improving the general aesthetics of the island. Um, and as I'm sure uh, the commission is aware, we have submitted uh, multiple documents, exhibits, photographs, uh, along with this request. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, for Steve. Um, should we uh, agree um, to uh, modify uh, the special permit? Um, would the new planting plan uh, become part of uh, uh, the uh, special permit approval? Technically, yes. Um you know, if you wanted to, you could ask them to, we could file something on the land records to, to document, you know, what the, the changes were, because, you know, it's quite possible something like that, if it's not recorded properly, would get missed further down the road. That would be maybe my suggestion if you had that concern. Okay. I, you know, it's, um, it's a very attractive, uh, um, small uh, condominium. I um, uh, expect that anything that, that will be done there um, will uh, will only uh, enhance it. My only concern were the bollards, um, and I'm very pleased uh, to see that um, you are placing those bollards because uh, the landscape area is relatively small, and um, um, someone who doesn't know the area uh, might run into it. Uh, and the bollards will protect the propane tanks uh, uh, as well as assure that. Uh, um, your generator is not damaged. Um, I I have no problem um, whatsoever with um, with this project. Um, I I I think it's uh, common sense. Wonder, frankly, uh, why it wasn't done some time ago. Uh, other comments? I have a question, um, Lou. Sure, Tammy. Thank you. I'm Miss Kirby. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I'm just wondering. Did um, the people that designed this for you consider burying the propane tanks? I see you have, I guess, two 120 gallon tanks. Did you just consider getting one and burying it? I, I'm going to defer to uh, Glenn on this. My understanding is that in terms of the depth of the actual island the in the height of the propane tanks, that wouldn't be um, something that could be done feasibly, but I'm gonna defer to him on that. We did inquire about that, but the gentleman from Connecticut uh, Generators recommended that we put them above ground. Okay, you didn't get I, any. Yeah, I just really. In, in the new constructions, when people are putting like whole house generators, they're usually burying the tanks. I'm just curious. I'm not, you know, here to judge one way or the other, but one one less thing to get hit. You know, if it's buried, <laughs> one less eyesore too. 
I asked the question early on, but we did not have a, a solid reason as to why we could. Okay. Thank you. And I apologize for cutting off. And with respect to the eyesore, um, it will be entirely uh, screened by those Arborvitae that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, you know, with respect to that issue, that is something that, um, you know, it won't be as much of an eyesore as it would be if it was just in the middle of the parking lot, for example. Okay, thank you. I have one comment. Mike here. Sure, go ahead, Mike. Uh, it's, I'm not. I'm going to approve this. Uh, of course, it, it's a no-brainer. Um, but I'll just, uh, as a landscape architect with a client right up the road, I know there's a lot of deer uh, in that neighborhood. And emerald green is deer food. Those are the arborvitaes that are very stiff and upright, and they get lollipopped uh, as high as the deer can reach. And green giant is an arborvitae variety that is deer resistant. Uh, they get bigger, but you have to, so you have to trim them more, but uh, just a suggestion and it's not a condition. So I'm just trying to help you out here uh, that you may find your emerald greens being eaten uh, rather quickly in the winter, only in the winters, that's when they eat them. So anyway, just a word of advice. Thanks, Mike, because actually the, the landscaper did mention the, green, the giant uh, arborvitas and that they were deer resistant. So that's what we were intending to do. Fortunately, this island is in the middle of the parking lot. That we really rarely see a deer in the parking lot, which is good. All right, great. Uh, any other questions or uh, comments? All right, if not, uh, can we have a motion to um, uh, approve? I'll make the motion to approve, Tammy. Okay. Tammy has uh, moved. Is there a second? This is Chapin, I'll second it. Okay, uh, Chapin uh, seconds. Um, uh, Steve, let's let's continue with uh, roll calls. Certainly, um, Mr. Uh, just getting my bearing, sorry. Uh, Ms. Lingalis? Yes, I approve. Ms. Jordan Byron? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Ms. Wells? Yes. Mr. Cantor? Yes. Mr. Mushak? Yes. Mr. Rowena? Yes. Mr. Bryce? Yes. And Mr. Shulman? Uh, I think you left out Mr. Oh, Mr. Pontius was not seated for this. Yeah, I, am not. I apologize. Yes. <laughs> it's unanimous. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Okay, uh, uh, item uh, uh, C, and um, for this, uh, um, I'll seat Mr. Uh, Pachas and unseat Mr. Bryce. <clears throat> uh, 05-20 SPR slash 07-20 CAM, uh, Wall Street Recap Associates, LLC, Municipal Holdings, uh, LLC 61 Wall Street requests to modify approval for six-story mixed-use building with 101 dwelling units and 10,233 plus or minus square feet of retail. And um, who is representing um, the uh, developer this evening? Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Mike Weisbrod with Krosky Architects in Hartford um, here on behalf of Wall Street Recap Associates. Um, so I'll quickly go through these changes and uh, share my screen if, if that's doable. Um, but basically, this is really just um, some refinements of the design that was previously approved in December of 2020. Um, we've advanced the drawings quite a bit since then, and we just wanted to um, show you a few of the refinements that have been made. Um, but generally we're keeping in spirit with the uh, previously approved project. All right, can everyone see the drawings? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm gonna um, talk about both buildings, um, talk about 61 Wall Street first, uh, which I'm calling North. Um, 
So this is a before plan of the, the basement. Um, if, if you recall that the previous developer um, intended to use the basement as a robo park system, which we felt was not feasible. So um, at this point, we didn't really have a plan for the basement, but at this point, um, Wall Street uh, Recap has um, identified the basement as potential use um, for a tenant. So what we are proposing to do here is carve out a section of um, the basement, which is a very high ceiling space uh, for the tenant. Um, the rest of the space on the per perimeter will remain um, utility rooms as they were before. And we are also providing a little bit better access from the through block arcade, which you'll see in a minute on the first floor to this space. We are creating a new lift from the first floor to the basement level, as well as a, an open stair to the arcade itself on the first floor, just to provide a little bit more of an open entry to the space, if you will. And we're also proposing, uh, because of the, the new stair and uh, elevator here, moving our bike storage from the first floor uh, to the basement here, as well as uh, relocating our fitness center, which is previously on the second floor to this space as well. What sort of tenant is looking at that space? Um, that I can't say. Um, okay. I. I don't know all the details and I'm not sure where they are on the negotiations. So I don't want gotcha. to uh, say no, I, I should. <laughs> it's just such it, an odd space. Yeah. Is there natural light down there? No, there is not. Okay. Um, so moving up to the first floor, this is a uh, before picture of the first floor. So as you see, the, the bike storage was in this area, the through block arcade to the covered parking here. Wall Street on the, the upper left here. So this is the after. Again, we're really just changing this area a little bit. We are um, adding our elevator uh, and our open stair, but basically uh, everything else remains exactly the same on the first floor. Um, some other internal changes that we are looking at doing. This is the before uh, second floor. Our fitness center was located on the, uh, the inside roof plaza um, area, um, just off of the, uh, the elevator bank here. As I just mentioned previously, we're proposing to move that to the basement now. And there was also a, a tenant storage that was located here on the, the second floor. So what we're proposing to do is change both of those spaces to apartments. So we're adding two apartments by doing this. Uh, the layouts would would mirror what's above. So that's two additional one bedroom units here. And the other change that we're making inside the building, which uh, this one does have a, an effect on the outside is the sixth floor. So the sixth floor, if you recall, the previous developer um, had created this little carve out on the roof. Um, weren't really sure why that was done, um, but what we are now looking to do is to recapture that space for a couple of more apartments. So we're adding uh, two apartments here. So we have a, a total net of four additional apartments. So we went from 101 to 105. And these are the affordable units, right? The affordable? Um, yeah, I believe they are. Um, I don't know if these new ones are gonna be 60% SMI. I believe they're 80% AMI. Gotcha. Yeah, but, but, but still have... the side of the building is more the affordable side versus the Isaacs, if I remember, was more full. Well, we've sprinkled the 60% uh, SMIs um, uh, throughout the building, so we're gotcha. not clustering them anywhere, but we're, we're not can, losing any. On this picture, can you orient us uh, where is sure. the... So Wall Street is up here where my cursor is moving on the mm -hmm. upper left, and Isaac Street runs back down this way. Um, so it's it's in the back of the, the building. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll show you an elevation of what that looks like in just a minute. Um, um, Mr. Weisbrot, so is the sure. center of the building void? There's like that white area in the middle, it was green before, yes, I can't read what it says. Yeah, so the on the second floor, uh, this is above the, the covered parking. Um, we're using the roof of the covered parking as a roof plaza. Um, here, but once you get above the second floor, the, the building itself is uh, it's more of a C-shaped. So this is looking down onto the courtyard, which is at the second floor level. And is there anything planned for the courtyard? Yes. Yeah, that's still going to be open green space for the residents. 
Thank you. Yep. Um, so moving on to the, the exterior of the building now, um, and I'll show you what that sixth floor um, infill looks like in just a moment, but just to capture a couple of other brief updates while we're here. Um, previously, we had proposed um, a mixture of casement and double hung windows, and the casement windows, we what were going to make, make them cold? look like double hung windows. Uh, so what we're now proposing to do on what Bailey? Um, both buildings is to make them all double hungs. And we still want to make um, the, the corner at Wall Street and Isaac to read differently with the Munton. So that's not changing. Um, but the other change that we, we ended up making, and this is definitely a betterment, um, if, if you ask me, but the, the previous developer um, proposed to use uh, a magic pack um, ventilation system for the apartments. And it had some louvers on the exterior facade um, that we originally proposed to integrate into the windows you can see here. Um, so when we came before you a few years ago, we proposed uh, this scheme here, but since then we've elected to choose a more energy efficient uh, mechanical system uh, that does not require these louvers. So we can now do away with those louvers and make um, the building have a more traditional fenestration pattern and not have to worry about these louvers anymore. So. Um, like I said, those louvers went away. The, uh, the double sliders here became triple sliders. So overall, uh, we, we gained quite a bit of uh, natural light by making that change. Another change that we uh, would like to make here is with, with respect to the balconies. And you'll see this in a rendering in just a minute. Before we had proposed these balconies to be um, like two to three feet deep, uh, we are now rethinking that to make them a little bit safer, just proposing to make them Juliet style balconies. So really just a railing in front of these sliders. Uh, we still meet our recreation space with all the other, um, excuse me, interior and exterior amenity space. Uh, so we're still in compliance there. And you'll get to see a rendering of that in just a minute. So this is the, again, before and the after. But like I said, they're really just small refinements. We're not messing with any of the other materiality or, or composition of the building. And moving along to the back of the building, uh, which is where the, this little indentation was um, previously. So this is the before and this is the after. So we're just carrying through the same vocabulary that we're using um, to create a, a rhythm of the building, if you will. So before and after. And uh, this is the other side of the building, the, the southern entry. One of the other things that we did here, uh, and I'll go back to the plan very quickly for this to get more easily understood. Um, what we wanted to do here above this uh, southern entry point is to create some exterior balconies that uh, really had uh, a little bit more of a footprint here. But again, with the, with the change of the balconies, we are now thinking that these are just going to become uh, Juliet style balconies, which is what the uh, previous developer uh, had proposed. They didn't uh, have this uh, triangular shaped balcony there. And you'll get to see that in just a minute. So that's the before and the after. And in terms of the, like I said, the balconies um, before, this is what they look like. And you can start to see uh, some of those louvers there, like I said, and this is the after, so uh, really not much of a change there. So those are the, the changes on 61 wall, um, pretty, pretty minor, and there's only really one change on 17 Isaacs, and it's, it's internal to the building. In order to um, get the required parking for those additional um, four apartments, what we are proposing to do is make the basement covered parking area just a little bit deeper to gain about 10 spaces. So this is the before plan of the, the basement level. And to orient ourselves, this is Isaac Street. This is the first floor. So you, you come in, you go down. And before you, you hit a wall right about here where you couldn't go any further. Uh, but what we are proposing to do now is just to continue down a little further to a flat spot and uh, this, area would have a, 
a connection to the elevator and stair, which would just go down one more story to meet it. And that's the only change on this building that's being proposed, other than the windows changing from casement to double hung, as I said. Is so there, that's that's that, is the ahead, park sorry. only for residents the under under grade parking? No, so um, this parking is going to be a um, mixture of, of open and for residents. Thank you. So that's that really summarizes the changes. Um, like I said, there would be we call refinements, so just natural development of the design is, of course, over time. Um, so happy to answer any other questions. Um, if well, there are any more. As, 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 as you can imagine, um, there, there's been an enormous amount of interest in this project, um, in large part because it's taken uh, so long um, uh, to uh, get it uh, moving with uh, the lawsuits. Sure. Um, when are you uh, anticipating um, moving forward with construction? I think that's going to be very soon. Um, we are just about done with the construction documents. Um, so we'll be going through um, a final permitting process with the city uh, very soon. Lou, can, I had one quick question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, can you can you give um, a range of what very soon means? W within a couple of months. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, I don't remember, Lou or Steve, I don't know if you remember, I, I vaguely remember Bob's design memo on this, talking a lot about windows and what was incorporated versus not. I'm assuming the changes that they're proposing are in line with what Bob made Bob's recommendations were in the design memo. It's just ringing a bell about the windows and I don't have the I can't I couldn't find it before this meeting so it, it, we can hold it as like a I mean I'm assuming it is so I just wanted to double yeah. check. My my recollection was is that we originally proposed casement windows and through the discussions with Bob um, he, he recommended double hung windows, which we then had proposed to disguise the casement at double hung. So now we're just making them double hungs in, in true form. I, I believe that's the case, if my memory serves me. And I, I, I think the issue here for us um, is whether we consider these uh, m minor changes. Um, Very fair. Yeah, I mean, as I think about it, uh, it seems to me we, we could have relied on the staff uh, to uh, approve these changes. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to uh, get a little more insight uh, and uh, to get some information on when they expect to be moving forward. So from that perspective, I'm, I'm glad it's come before us. Uh, but my view uh, is uh, that, uh, that these are relatively minor uh, changes to the project. I have a question, Mike here. Sure, Mike. Uh, I remember when the commissions were combined, you guys had already seen this and this planning commission, which I was served on previous before the planning and zoning commission was combined, had seen parts of it. But I don't recall seeing the... Uh, movie theater, the old garden cinema site uh, plan. If I missed it, I apologize. And I, it's somewhat relevant to this. I'm just curious, is there a plan submitted for that parking lot? I know it's a staging area, but is it going to be a parking lot eventually? So the the garden cinema site is, is this building you see here. Um, and apologies, I just have the the one plan to show you before and after, but uh, this will be a new mixed use building. So it'll be um, about 160 parking spaces on the lower few levels with 50 apartments on top. Is that where you're adding, is this where you're adding the, uh, the extra parking underneath or is that the original building? Yes, that's, there'll be a few spaces on the original building uh, to the interior of the first floor. Uh, but the majority of the parking for both buildings is located in, in the 17 Isaac Street, which was where the Garden Cinema Center building was. And you're, so there are no changes you're proposing to that building then? So the only changes, like I said, are we're, we're just digging down a little bit deeper to, right. to gain some more spaces. 
So it's invisible, really. So yes. okay. Correct. Well, no, there's the there's the change above on the uh, roof. The cutout is now going to be uh, additional apartments on sixty one wall. Yes, uh, that was on the original building, the C shaped building. Right. Not the Garden Cinema building. That's correct. correct. They're going to have great views from there. I know that because you can see the building from Mill Hill. It kind of rises above Wall Street. So they're going to have views. Those upper floors are going to have views down the river. Uh, I think it'll be you know, pretty nice to see that when you wake up in the morning. Anyway, that's all. Yeah, so um, I have a question. Um, is there any green space? Yeah, so there's... Um... Apologies, I don't have uh, the full set of plans here, but uh, it, there are some plantings um, in, in back of 17 Isaacs um, behind the building. And there, there are two occupiable roofs, one on the, the middle of this building and the other um, on the top of this building. So when you say occupied, uh, do you mean roof gardens? Yeah, there'll be some plantings up there, areas where residents and people can come up to enjoy the views and whatnot. And I think there's a little pocket park in the south. Correct. Corner. Yeah. Yeah, there is a little uh, a little park here in the back of the building. And there'll be lots of plantings along the street with tree wells and, and everything like that. So a lot of improvements to the, uh, the street. That's now ringing all, it's all ringing a bell. I think we had a joint meeting before we were combined on this. That's as I recall, but about two years ago. All right. Um, Lou, if I may. Sure. Yeah, Mr. Weisbrod, um, with regard to the garage building, and I was on just the uh, planning commission before as well, there was conversation about the wall that you, as you, um, come in off of Isaac Street, the wall of the parking lot was rather, um, let's just say unimaginative. And I'm wondering, do you have any renderings of that? Do we, has this project been approved? Do we know what that looks like? Because it was. Yes, uh, um, if, if you bear with me for just a moment here, I can pull up some uh, renderings uh, from the original submission package that we're really not proposing to change at this point. But Tammy, to uh, your first question, uh, the pro project has been approved. Uh, it was approved by the uh, Zoning Commission. Um, and okay. all, all so we're being, what we're being asked to do tonight is uh, simply uh, determine if we consider these minor changes and um, if, if so, to approve them. Okay. Well, it would be great if um, we could see what has been proposed again, just to see what it looks like. Uh, absolutely. Can everyone see the renderings there? <laughs> okay. Yes. So this is the view as you come down Isaac Street before you make the turn. Um, so the upper floors are residential. The, uh, the openings here are actually um, to the parking garage, and we've designed some um, faux storefronts, if you will, to mimic what we have on the actual storefronts for the retail spaces on 61 wall. But these will be deep enough for displays, uh, for artwork and whatnot. So they'll they'll still activate the street um, as if they were storefront. And this is a rendering looking back the other way towards the building. So the Bend and Isaac Street is the other way now. Um, so again, this, this part of the, the building, which you can see from the street, is a little bit more... Um, aesthetically interesting than it was before with just the parking garage, if you will. So two floors of parking, one at grade and one on the second floor, and then two floors of um, residential apartments. Yeah, two above grade parking and one below with two levels of apartments. Oh, all right. So actually three levels of parking. Yes with some, some public and some reserved for the residents. Correct. Do you know what the breakout is? I don't recall. Do you know how many total? Um, 167, I believe. We had 157 before. Uh, so I believe we're up to 167 in the garage now. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
Uh, any other questions for Mr. Weisbrot? If if not, uh, can I have a um, motion um, to uh, uh, either approve or uh, not approve these as uh, minor changes? Galen? I'll move to approve them as minor changes. Okay, is there a second? Mike seconds. Mike and Hector seconded. Uh, okay. Uh, Steve, uh, let's continue with our roll calls. How go now? No, no. Steve, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering why Darius wasn't responding to me. <laughs> I was muted. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Pachas. Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Jordan Byron? Yes. Ms. Lingallis? Yes. Ms. Wells? Yes. Mr. Cantor? Yep. Mr. Mushak? Yes. Mr. Rowena? Yes. And Mr. Shulman? Yes. Okay, unanimous. Okay. Um, what about Nick Cantor? Oh, did he go off? Sorry, that, Mr. Cantor? Or did we lose Mr. Cantor? By the way, Anna Tavashnik uh, is online as well. Nick, you were muted. Yes. Um, Before he, if he dropped oh, off. Sorry, I said yes. Oh. I heard my name. I'm, just to be clear, I'm here uh, listening, but I'm driving. I'm not, not to be seated while driving. Okay. <laughs> it, it, Anna, it's not because you're driving, it's because you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> I actually can see, <laughs> but, um, but I shouldn't be looking. Let's put it that right. way. Right. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you in any case. Thanks. Um, uh, the next uh, item uh, Thank you. For, for which, um, I'm sorry, you're welcome. We're going to uh, uh, unseat Mr. Pachas and um, uh, seat Mr. Bryce. Uh, this is item 2023-30 SPR, the Norwalk Conservatory of the Arts, 69 Wall Street, District 1, Block 29, Lot 11, change of use from office to college slash university for the Norwalk Conservatory of the Arts. Um, who is uh, representing... Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, do you intend to, because the next item is um, Are the public, public hearing item on one, two, one or two East Ave, do you want to take them together or do you want, and obviously you have to vote separately on those two, but do you want to um, handle well, one at a time? We, we have this one, Steve, uh, under review and action, not under public hearing. Now, is that a, an error uh, on the part of the uh, agenda? Um, no, because the, the, the first one, uh, for 69 wall is a site plan application. So, so that, that you can take action on right away. The other one has a separate action, but they're really, the two are tied together. So I don't know if you want to have them present together like that, just because the school and the dormitory are kind of tied and linked together. So it's kind well, of, I don't have any problem having them linked uh, together, but uh, they're going to have to go over it a second time uh, during the public hearings in order for uh, uh, us to have a complete record. Okay. But that's fine. That's fine with me. Mr. I like to talk. Yeah, I, I don't mind saying it all again. Okay. So then why don't we start uh, with uh, 69 Wall Street? Awesome. Hello, I'm Danny Loftus-George from the Norwalk Conservatory of the Arts. Uh, it's nice to see some of you again. Um, so this is for 69 Wall Street. This is our flagship building. Um, and uh, the conservatory is opening in August. Uh, we have 50 committed students, which is very exciting. We got there. Um, of those 50, there is only one coming from Connecticut. The rest are coming from across uh, the country. We have many from Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, California. I'm really all over. Um, 
Uh, I'm proud to say every student this year coming to the college is on scholarship, which is very exciting. Um, we are over 50% BIPOC in terms of our student population. Um, and we have three majors. There is television and film performance, dance performance, and musical theater. Uh, we've taken 16 in each major, so there are 48 students total. Um, this uh, building in particular uh, has uh, three different floors, four different floors. Um, the first floor is just for recreation for the kids to hang out in between classes. Uh, the basement floor has a library space uh, as well as some administration offices um, and a small studio space. The second floor um, has a dance space and the third floor has three small rooms that can be used for acting classes uh, as well as vocal lessons. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to tell you other things to do with the building. Um, so I, I guess we go to questions. I'm not sure. Are, th are there questions uh, uh, for Mr. Loftus, George? I think the big question is, is, is the school approved? Ah, uh, yes. So are you talking about accreditation? Yes. Yeah, so we're undergoing accreditation with Connecticut State Department of Higher Education presently. Um, so there are three accreditors and accreditation isn't just uh, a go process. Um, it's, it's a constant back and forth and that, that's true for the rest of time. Um, so Connecticut State Department of Higher Education needs to approve each individual program. Uh, it's called program licensure. The other two accrediting bodies are NECHI and NAST. NAST is the National Association for Schools of Theater, and NECHI is the New England chapter for higher education. Um, those, so, so essentially, um, how to break it down. The Connecticut State Department of Higher Education allows us to grant degrees. NECHI and NAST allows us uh, to access Title IV funding. Um, so right now we are internally, you know, scholarshipping all the students. Ideally, uh, when we are approved by, by NAST or, or NECHI, we are able to access um, FAFSA funding. So Pell Grants, Stafford Loans, et cetera, for students to attend. And we have not applied for NECHI or NAST. Uh, we cannot apply until we've run two years of classes. Um, so after two years of classes have gone through, then we will apply for those accreditations. The accreditation that I'm asking you about has to do with our ability to approve your school, and that would be the Connecticut accreditation. So you're talking about the State Department of Higher Education? Yes. Yeah, we, we, we won't be approved up until August, um, is, is when we're expected to be approved there. So Steve, maybe you could uh, run through with us again the sequence of events that has to happen in order for us to take an affirmative stance on this application. Well, um, Richard, when, uh, when we go to the public hearings after this uh, conversation, you'll notice in uh, the resolution um, that uh, the resolution does, does uh, give a date by which they need to be accredited um, in order uh, in order for our action uh, to become live, in effect. Um, I did notice that, yes. It's, it's um, a little bit of a chicken and the egg scenario. Yes. Trying to see who goes first. Um, you know, I, I mean, it, it, I, will, I will admit it put us would, would put us in a little bit of a quandary if for some reason they didn't get their accreditation by that uh, January 1 date. Uh, at which point we probably have to come back to you to figure out if there was a, you know, a, a resolution. Um, but at the same time, trying to, you know, be uh, accommodating to something that could be really beneficial to the city over the long term, which is why the, the condition language was put together the way it was. So I think, so Mr. I Chairman, what you... Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll fit, I'm sorry, JJ. I, I think the, based on what you said before, I think since this is a site, the site plan specific application to 1609 wall, once you, uh, as the commission, get through with your Q and A um, with, with the applicant, you could take action on 169 wall and then quiet, uh, during the public hearing review. I'm sorry, I'm getting. Some I'm other some, voices coming through. Yeah, someone has a microphone open. Um, Danny George. That's me. Yeah, someone else is using the link clearly. Yeah, so I think you could take action on 69 Wall and then take action on the East Ave dormitory 
process after the public hearing on that, but then think about what, what the ramifications are between the two as part of that. It's, it's, it's also very tricky on our, like you said, chicken and egg, because we, we actually can't apply for accreditation until we have a space. Um, so that's part of the accreditation process as well. Um, so they need to be able to review the space to accredit us. Um, so it's, 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 it's a little catch-22 there. All right. Um, I have a question. question. Go ahead, JJ. Hey, this is JJ. So you mentioned at the start of your presentation that you currently have 50 students enrolled, of which most of them, I think you mentioned like all of them, except for maybe one or two, are from out of state. So what is your outreach in terms of- Yeah, that's of a great, that's, that's such a great question. Um, yes, yeah, so, so uh, what is it? Yeah, this is the 43rd college I've been at. Um, so I have been in the business of revitalizing uh, performing arts departments for a whole bunch of different schools uh, across the country. Um, and I, I was a Broadway actor for a long time. Um, so I have a lot of uh, close relationships with performing arts high schools across the country. Um, I've been nurturing young talent for a long time, I actually worked for Playbill for a long time. Um, so I, I have been going into Title I schools for the last uh, 10 years and building those relationships. Okay, so how, how, what do you plan to do about building relationships within the, you know, Fairfield County or the city of Norwalk or even the state of Connecticut if yeah, most I'm of your so, students I'm, are from out, of, of, from out of state? I'm so glad that you asked. Um, two things there. So in, the, in immediacy, we're actually working with uh, about 10 to 12 different restaurants in the area to come up with the meal plan. Um, we don't have a cafeteria internally, so we wanted to make sure that we were helping the restaurants, especially after COVID. So we have um, a, a, essentially a student meal plan where uh, parents can load up the kid's student ID with funds, and then they can spend it at restaurants um, and uh, be awarded uh, those funds, obviously. Um, Past that, uh, we have a uh, ideally a pipeline program that cannot go into effect yet um, until we have the right major for it uh, with uh, Norwalk Public Schools. So I've been meeting with the superintendent there um, to try to build a more content specifically um, for, for Norwalk students. Thank you. That's the answer to the question. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I got it right. You kind of went around the block a little bit. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. I wasn't sure what you were asking, so that's my fault. Thank you. Thank can you. I can see the involvement. You can see the involvement or the intention to be involved with the community because I met Mr. George uh, a couple of weeks ago at the business roundtable that Steve was spearheading. So uh, they are one of those business partners that that look to be invested in the in the city. I have clients that are actually asking about the conservatory because of the uh, this is something that it's new to the whole area so uh it's it's a really welcome uh new product for for the whole um county really thank you hector tammy you had a question oh uh, yes thank you um mr george how many uh years until the student or students receive a degree how many years is the program that's a great question. So it's a two-year associates program. Um, we are planning to turn into a, a baccalaureate program into a four-year and then ideally a full-fledged university with a master's program as well. Um, but right now it is a two-year associates. Okay. And I've got a couple more that kind of tail onto that. So yeah. if you're starting with 50 students, what would your maximum enrollment be? 50. Um, oh, for, 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 two, for, yeah, yeah. for two years, it, it would be um, essentially 96 students. And we want to make sure we're maintaining quality and we're not growing too fast. Um, so 96 students, we have a three to one faculty ratio. Oh, so like 50 per grade, if you will. And then That's one correct. graduates, another one comes in. Would you anticipate adding more, like another, you know, another oh, grade yes. 50? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would love to grow uh, the, the university as big as possible. Um, I would love to have 1,500, 2,000 students in that area um, to really spur economy. I think that's really exciting. It would mean adding a whole a bunch more majors. Um, you know, we don't want um, 50 in a musical theater class when there aren't that many jobs on Broadway. Um, but it, it would be, you know, adding other majors that are exciting that aren't really offered uh, in the county. Um, and, it's, and certainly not Norwalk that would excite people. Okay, and one more, if I may. Uh, so you say that all of your 50 students currently are receiving full scholarship. 
uh, where is your funding coming from and what happens if that funding runs out? Do you, what that's, kind of that's tuition a great do question. you say? Yeah, so all students are on scholarships, not all are on full scholarships. About 35% okay. are on full scholarships. The rest are on partial. When we say partial, the majority of those partial are at least half tuition. Um, and we, uh, in the last two years, we've built some fundraising in town. We have done a haunted house every year with the Sono Collection. And we also do Broadway in the park. Uh, this year, we're doing it at the Sono Collection because of the renovations at Lockwood Matthews. Um, and so uh, we are, uh, we're essentially still fundraising. We'll still have those events. We also uh, have received a good amount of uh, uh, grants um, and we are well funded at this point. Okay. So what the tuition uh, is? Yeah, our tuition is $39,190 annually. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Anna and then uh, Chapin. Let me turn down the Yeah, hi. Um, sort of following up on JJ's question. Do you have a goal, either a goal or a minimum number of students from Connecticut that you would like to see? Or is it intended to be sort of blind or agnostic as to where the students come from? It is definitely more blind. Um, for these majors, we are looking for the skill uh, skill set, really. We also uh, really cater to kids from Title I schools. Um, so we are, we're really specific about going into Title I schools. We did a lot of recruitment this year throughout Connecticut. We went to, I mean, you name it, every uh, a, a lot of schools uh, in Connecticut, a lot of Title I institutions. Um, so no, there, there's no quota or goal in terms of which state they're coming from. Um, we're, we're really just looking for the most skilled students. Mr. George, uh, for those who don't know what it is, can you just explain what a Title I school is? Yeah, so Title I school essentially is for uh, schools that are uh, below the poverty line. Um, so I think it's it's over 75% free or reduced lunches is, is what deems a school a Title I school. Okay, um, Chapin? Yeah, um, following a similar line of question, um, maybe you can't speak to this now without the accreditation, but um, is there thoughts or plans to do any sort of summer programs? We maybe have, uh, yeah, yeah, so we have one, we, we do have two summer programs, um, and it is uh, for high school students, uh, that has a, a lot of Connecticut students in it, um, so it's really for Connecticut students to figure out if they want to pursue the arts, um, if they want conservatory training, if they're looking for a traditional four-year, um, how they want to pursue it, and what they'd like to do in their future, so those summer programs do exist. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I'm going to cut off the discussion uh, at this point. Uh, Mr. Mr. George, I, I can't ask you to speak um, until we're uh, in the public hearing, uh, at which point you can raise your hand. Um, uh, at this point in the meeting, uh, the only folks who can uh, ask questions are uh, uh, members of the commission. Um, and with that, <clears throat> I think um, um, we've had a uh, good introductory conversation. Let's move to uh, the public hearings. Uh, as uh, uh, Steve has uh, suggested, it probably makes sense for us to discuss both items, uh, although we'll act on the uh, items uh, individually. Uh, for members of the public uh, who are uh, uh, listening, uh, let me briefly explain uh, how we conduct the public hearings. Um, we will uh, ask uh, Mr. Loftus George to uh, explain uh, uh, both uh, the program uh, and uh, the housing um, in uh, as much detail as um, he feels is necessary. During that time, the commission members, of course, are free uh, to ask any questions. Uh, in this case, since uh, we uh, we we weren't required to take any action. Uh, I'm going to keep Mr. Um, uh, Bryce uh, uh, seated uh, on um, on this matter. Um, uh, after um, uh, the uh, presentation, uh, we will uh, open it up to the public for comment. Um, we don't uh, set a time limit on. Um, uh, comments from the public, but we do ask that um, uh, you um, 
uh, be as short as uh, possible uh, while making sure you ask any questions that are uh, important for you, since you only have one opportunity to uh, speak. And uh, we simply ask that uh, uh, the questions and the conversation be kept civil. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, every member of the public who wishes to speak uh, has had an opportunity, um, we will then uh, turn it uh, back to Mr. Loftus George to respond to the questions and the comments uh, that he's uh, heard, uh, after which um, we will uh, close the hearing and move to action. Uh, before we open it, Steve, you had comment. Yeah, just very quickly, um, I we just got an email in right around uh, 20 minutes ago from a letter of support for the special permit application. I, I emailed it to everybody, but I'm happy to read it into the record later on at the conclusion of uh, public comment, if you'd like. Okay, that makes that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Uh, George, uh, I'm going to suggest that you lower your hand so that when you wish to speak later in the public hearing, when you raise your hand, we'll recognize that it's a new raised hand and not the one that's uh, that's been up uh, for a while. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Loftus George, I'll I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'll give an overview of the school again. Uh, same thing as as before. Um, so we are a new college conservatory of the arts. Um, we are offer three majors: musical theater. Uh, music theater dance and television film performance. Um, we take 16 in each major for a total of 48 students. Um, we uh, are operating uh, out of 69 Wall Street, ideally. Um, so this is a building that has four floors. Uh, the basement floor has a library, uh, a small studio space, as well as administrative offices. The first floor is just recreation for students. Uh, the second floor is a, a big dance space. And then the top floor is three smaller studios that can be used for television film, um, as well as uh, music practice uh, rooms. Um, we're really excited to uh, bring in our students. We had 1,800 audition this year, um, and we only accepted 48, which is really exciting. Our numbers are great there. This is for a two-year associates program. Um, we plan to grow majors, uh, ideally, and, and grow the school gradually. Um, we, oh God, I, I don't know what else I need to add there. Oh, dormitories. Um, so our dormitories are located on 102 East Ave. Uh, there is enough uh, for room for 48 students. Uh, it's, it's really why we capped our numbers and also to make sure we ensure quality. Um, it is a three-story building. Uh, there are um, communal restrooms as well as gender neutral restrooms as we have a lot of students um, uh, who are pretty gender fluid. Um, we are not allowing cars on campus, which is really exciting. Uh, we did take uh, Mr. Mushak's suggestion and now we have bike racks available to students, which is great. Um, so we hope to, to really push bikes as much as humanly possible. Um, my goodness, I'm not sure what else I'm supposed to add here. Um, but uh, that, that's that's the, the conservatory in a nutshell. Everything is in walking distance to each other, which is nice. Uh, we have a partnership with several local restaurants, which is really cool. Um, and uh, a partnership with the Norwalk Inn, which is really exciting as well, uh, as prospective parents and students uh, can stay there um, for a discounted rate, which is really exciting. And I well, think that's we already, everything. We already approved the dormitory, right? Like a six or nine months ago or something like that? I, I believe we approved language uh, permitting uh, a dormitory. Gotcha. Uh, so so 110 is being looked at right now as well. Okay. If that was the focus of the the text amendment. Was this application in mind when you made that change? Gotcha. Uh, um, other questions or uh, comments? Yeah, Mike Mushak here. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, uh, do you have any information, uh, Mr. George, on um, the amount of spin-off economic activity that 
let's say every dollar spent in an art school uh, by an art student or, uh, you know, is, is there just any round figure like that? We kind of have numbers for apartments, you know, ge very generic, but uh, do you have anything that can add to the economic activity, which, you know, is obvious to me that there's going to be a lot of economic activity that's going to spin off from this. And it's, yeah, and it could be exponential based on the, the amount of money that's actually the students are paying for tuition. It, 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 like you said, restaurants, et cetera. But do you have any numbers uh, to add to that? Yeah, I wish I had hard data for you. Um, I, I apologize, I don't. I will say that I've been at many colleges uh, before this, including UConn. Um, you know, that, that was my big Connecticut school. I've been at 42 schools before this, and the power of college and university to spur economy is unparalleled. Um, so yes, uh, bringing residents in, especially that are just here for um, seven months, uh, you know, of the year and are the first time on their own, ready to explore the town and eat and live and um, be here is huge, but no, I, I don't have data points, unfortunately. Okay, uh, we certainly know uh, it's positive. So, right, it's definitely gonna be in positive territory. So is the, sorry, I'm just anchoring myself back to the, the dorms. Is the, the plan for the dorms to fit within the current building that that's there? completely yes, like no so, new construction it's all internal refab yeah so what was exciting about the building it was an optometrist office so it was a bunch of individual rooms um already uh, which was really exciting is there any need to use the dormitories uh, for the summer programs yes what um, uh, that happened to a, uh, was it an optometrist or an ophthalmologist? I'm, I'm sorry, I wish I knew the difference. I, 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 think, I, really I think it may have been my ophthalmologist who, who retired. It was Dr. Wong. Who was, yes, who was an ophthalmologist. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so you, I mean, I, I know the space. So clearly uh, there are gonna be a fair amount of renovations uh, necessary in order for that to uh, be used as a dormitory space. Uh, are the uh, funds in place to accomplish that? Yes. Um, the, the biggest issue, uh, really, you know, upstairs was two apartments already. Um, so that was pretty easy. The, the big issue is actually uh, the, the main, the water line coming in. Um, so Dr. Wong had uh, plumbing throughout uh, because each room needed uh, plumbing, but they were never used at the same time. Um, so unfortunately, the main is not big enough coming in. We did we do have a special permit to do uh, that work this weekend, uh, and we have a plumber and everything in place to install a new line. We've been working with uh, First District to make that happen. Good. Um, you, other other questions? Have you looked at putting solar on the roof at all? No, I don't know the first thing about it, and I'd love to explore that option. We we are uh, we do believe that we're we're going to be awarded an EverSource grant, um, but solar would be the ideal situation. Awesome, Mr. Chairman. Do you have one gentleman with his hand raised who I think is rep working with the applicant? I believe on, on this. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I believe there is a gentleman with his hand raised that is working on behalf of the applicant. Um, is that Regal Properties? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you can can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you. Uh, Zoom has been giving me challenges throughout this week, so I appreciate everybody being here. Um, Attorney Rowena, how are you? Uh, and we we go forward with this uh, being said. I'm sorry. Um, can you can you in, introduce yourself, please? Oh, my 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 apologies. I, I expect so. Uh, Brian Brian A. Clark Jr. I am a real estate broker uh, within the city. Uh, I do represent um, the college uh, as far as the acquisitions of real estate uh, properties. Uh, with that being said, I, I would like for the city to participate with us, um, and, and we have been doing very well. 
Uh, Mr. Kleppen, thank you for you know everything you've done for us so far. Um, and the as far as the dormitory goes, we're we're all in compliance. And I just want wanted to be noted. This is something that is going to impact the city in a very very positive way. Um, this is something that our city needs. Uh, something that our city desires. Um, and that that that's my take on it. And overall, um, Danny, if there's anything else you, you need me to to allude to, I will. But overall, for me, this is something we need, and this is something that we should have. Period. Thank you, uh, Mr. Loftus. Uh, anything else? No, that's everything. Okay. Uh, uh, any further comments before we open it up to uh, the public? All right, hearing none. Um, Steve, will you explain um, how members of the public uh, uh, can access the site? Sure, if you would like to speak to this uh, specific public hearing, you can use the raise your hand function, which is at the bottom of your screen. I believe we do have uh, one individual calling in by phone. At that point, uh, if you are calling in by phone, hit the um, excuse me, hit the star nine button on your phone, and that will allow you to raise your hand. Once I bring you in to talk, then it would be star six to actually speak. Um, but we do have one individual right now who wishes to speak. Um, let me just get over there. All right, so we have uh, Mr. Pavia, you're, you, you can unmute yourself. Uh, Mr. Pavia, could you please uh, give us your name and your address? Go ahead, Mr. Pavia. Oh, you, you're unmuted now. All right, Steve, let's see if there's anyone else. We'll come back to Mr. Pavia. Maybe sure. he can work out his um, uh, technical problem. Mr. Bonifant has his hand raised. I just, you can okay. unmute yourself, Rich. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? We can yeah. hear you, Richard. Okay, thank you. Um, Rich Bonifant, Park Hill Avenue. Uh, the concept of the school sounds like a nice idea, and I, I'm, not, I'm not against anything like that. But uh, I'm just curious about the dormitory use of of the address there on East Avenue. The dormitory designation, what does that mean? You don't need parking requirements or something like that, I'm guessing. But um, if, it's, if the building is designated as a dormitory, that means you can't rent out the apartments to anybody else that's going to that school. And, um, and no cars are allowed there, or I, I don't know, maybe, when you guys are explaining back and forth, you, you could say, say how that goes, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Dan, Danny, do you wanna take this one or you want me no, to? No, let's, uh, let's wait until we've heard all the comments and then uh, you can, you can uh, respond to them. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, Mr. Pavia, um, you appear to be on. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, Anthony Pavia, uh, Buckingham Place, um, 34 Buckingham Place. Uh, also a co-founder of the City Hall Neighborhood Association. Um, you know, I, I speak as both a resident of Buckingham Place, which is pretty much a neighbor of the, of the dorm, and also of the Neighborhood Association. I think the, the prospect of having the conservatory is really exciting. Also, as an educator, um, you know, I think education is never a bad use of a property. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the residents of Buckingham Place, Lockwood Lane, uh, Moody's Lane, uh, are just, um, you know, I think the concerns around traffic and walkability and safety and bikeability um, that were present before this application 
I think are going to be present after the application, if it's approved or not. Um, you know, and I think that uh, our recent uh, campaign around raising awareness of East Avenue safety, I, mean, I think as long as that continues to be a focus of, of the city, I think we're happy. I'm happy to be a neighbor um, of, of the conservatory. Um, and as long as after, um, if, if the application is approved, um, you know, the, we continue to monitor uh, pedestrian safety, uh, especially as Mr. Lofter just, just uh, alluded to the fact that there's going to be like a potential uh, uh, Norwalk in discount as people are trying to cross East Avenue to get to the dormitory, making sure that those folks are safe. Um, and that there, there's a con there's a continued focus on that pedestrian and 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 bike safety. Lastly, um, it's it's um, it's a, it's a weird intersection to begin with. It's uh, in its configuration, so just making sure that the safety of drivers of 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 students walking to and from uh, of residents trying to exit the street because Buckingham is actually one way is a is a dead end, I should say. Um, just making sure that that remains the focus. I think. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be a neighbor of and 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 hopefully this the conservatory is is successful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have oops, jumping around. We have the East Norwalk Neighborhood Association. You're unmuted. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Actually, this is Diane CC, Olmstead Place. Um, I'm logged in under the association login um, for a later item we're observing. So I'm actually speaking as a private residence. I'm not speaking on behalf of ENA. Um, I uh, paid close attention to the application, um, I think it was a year ago to the day maybe, of the zone amendment that allows a dormitory to exist on East Avenue at all. And um, members of the commission may recall then that I had uh, many serious concerns with opening up East Avenue corridor for that use. Um, albeit this is a small use at this point, but it does mean that many other parcels could be used. Um, but regardless, that ship has sailed. So the zone actually allows this, but it does come into you as a special permit. And just wanted to um, remind folks who, from the public who are listening, that that allows you to consider um, other quality of life issues that you might not have to take into account for something as of right. Um, I have, um, and if I can impose on Mr. Kleppen or someone else, I have a series of questions. And I know that I can't jump in if something isn't um, answered or clarified. So maybe if you could just jot them down, because I know the applicant will address them at the end. Um, the first is a couple of technical points. I think the first one was answered. Um, I had noticed a while ago that the Norwalk Inn, I would consider an abutter for the legal notices, but they were never notified for the zone amendment or the um, housing permit. Um, but I, I've heard tonight now though, that they are aware and they're actually partnering with the school in terms of providing um, discounts, which I think is a good thing. Um, and I'm, I'm glad if, you know that's the case that they're in the loop there. Um, the other technical items have to do with um, the, the application itself. Um, Mr. Kleppen's department has um, implemented um, a program where residents are able to see full applications, especially special permits, on the city website. And for this particular application, there's literally just one document. It's like the bare bones application that was um, submitted by Mr. George, I'm um, kind of fill in the blanks, but there's no other documents with it that actually provide a lot of detail. And um, I wondered, um, because we see other applications come in where the applicant or their expert or their attorney will provide their responses to the 13 special permit considerations. And that's not included with this application unless um, perhaps Mr. Kleppen has it and it hasn't been posted. But normally the public has the benefit of seeing the applicant's um, remarks regarding all 13 of those. Um, I bring that up because not the least of it is um, things you have to consider are things like noise, um, noise pollution, um, light pollution, um, an increase in um, utility usage, um, uh, trash and recycling, um, impacts there with, with food, 
um, with garbage, with rodents. Um, I believe there'll be laundry facilities on site. Um, so that's, that's another point um, that I hope someone will address. And I also realized that they would have there would have been a waiver for any consideration of um, having to look at traffic for this plan because the applicant is proposing that they are um, they're prohibiting parking on site. Students are not allowed to have cars. Um, or to, if I understood Mr. George correctly last year, uh, he said that they're not allowed to have cars at all. So it's not a. We were concerned that they could own, you know, have cars while they're in school and then just be parking them on all the side streets. So um, hopefully we'll get some clarification on that. But nevertheless, um, the, just the um, students' cars and traffic would not be your only consideration because it would still be um, probably a substantial amount of cars in and out of there for 50 students um, living in the dorm for things like, you know, Uber in and out or uh, food and, you know, restaurant takeout delivery in and out, et cetera. So um, I hope that you would take that into account. Um, last year, um, Mr. George had indicated that the um, occupancy for the building would be at 52. And I think he, he stated he's right around that. Um, but that at that time, he had a goal of at least 500 students ramped up over several years. And um, I wondered what he might have in mind. And, and I think tonight he said, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 long term. And not that it's germane to this application, but I wonder what he had in mind for um, housing those students in, this, in the second year. Um, as you begin that growth. Um, an, another question, uh, and, and in that way, I wondered if the school and the, um, the sub uh, real estate um, under it um, owns other parcels. The, um, another question I had is, um, we, are, are there people occupying that building now? And um, are they tenants who were under a lease when you purchased the building or um, if there's anyone in the building now, um, who are there and how many people and is it operating as a dorm now? Um, because I think the website still indicated that um, that is an active dormitory for the school. Maybe, maybe that's been corrected at this point. Um, and then I, um, again, with the combination of you looking at the school and the need for the dormitory, I wondered if Mr. George could clarify if the $39,000 a year tuition includes housing or if there's a separate housing fee associated with the use of the parcel that the students would pay and um and if it's not included in the tuition i wonder if he would be able to share that i think he spoke about that last year as well and then i think my final point is back on the cars again because even though there's no cars allowed i think the final verbiage that staff provided you last year on the zoning amendment was to allow under a dormitory use to have one half space per unit. And so um, I, I wondered how that would work if it's allowed, but the school is saying, well, we're not going to um, allow it and we're going to prohibit it. My question would be is who would be enforcing that and how would it be enforced and what would be the city oversight? Finally, I want to say that um, I did communicate with Mr. Pavia, um, our good friends across the bridge there in um, at the City Hall Neighborhood Association. And we do understand that um, both he and the Norwalk Green Association are supporting the application. And of course, um, um, you know, me just personally, I would say, you know, I'm supporting the, the use of, a, um, of the school. And I just would like to have my questions and my concerns about this particular parcel address this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh... Anyone else who wishes to speak? No one, Mr. Shulman. Okay, Mr. Loftus George, uh, we'll turn it back to you to respond uh, to what you have heard. 
Okay, um, thank you for, for weighing in and for your feedback. Uh, I think I got answers to most of these questions. Um, so uh, we'll start with uh, uh, the noise uh, and the concern there. And we do have a resident advisor living on campus um, and we will have quiet hours um, for our students there. This is the first time they left home. So we wanna make sure we're protecting them as well. Um, so there is a resident advisor in place at all times. Um, in terms of uh, garbage, we will have private uh, garbage collection, um, and that'll occur, uh, I think we're going to do every other day, uh, is what it's at now. If we have to make it every day, we can make that happen, um, and we will have a dumpster on premises. Um, uh, in terms of cars, yeah, that's correct. Um, the only uh, way that a student would potentially ever have a car um, is through accreditation. We must allow if a student has a medical exemption um, with ADA compliance that we have to allow them uh, that transportation. So um, that, that would be the only reason a student would ever be permitted a car. Um, if, if they medically need a car, we are not going to reject that. Um, uh, there are there, there's a question about um, people coming to the dorms. We we don't allow guests in the dorms. Um, it's a privacy concern for the students. Uh, so uh, their parents are there to move them in uh, first day and move them out. Their parents are not even allowed in the dorms. Otherwise, um, we want to make sure we're respecting all the students' privacy. Uh, 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 no, we we don't own any other parcels. I think that was a question. It's it's just the dormitories. Um. There are no occupants living at the dormitory at all. Um, and uh, housing fee, yes, housing fee is separate. Um, however, this year we have matched all Pell Grants. Um, so any student uh, that was awarded a Pell Grant, we have matched for their housing. Um, and that's, that's how we worked it this year. I think that is answers to all the questions that were asked. Uh, I'm... Sorry, Ms. Cece, I'm not going to be able to call on you a second time. Ms. Cece, if you have other questions, please feel free to send me an email or um, whatever. I'm happy to, to chat with you and, and to, to work with you however we can. Um, are there any other questions from uh, members of the uh, commission? Did this go to TMP, Steve? Well, anyone, does anyone know? Uh, I don't know if we have comments from TMP or not on this. Not possible. Uh, is there a way we can just make a condition then just more from a pedestrian standpoint? I think what the letter that uh, Mr. Pavia and uh, Mr. Craig had said, I think may lead to some interesting things, especially with crosswalks or things there. So I would just be thinking it important to, uh, we get their view on it. Uh, well, it's interesting, Nick, uh, uh, while I didn't see anything in any of the materials from PMP, uh, Mr. Craighead, in his support of the project, uh, did uh, refer to the substantial uh, amount of money that TMP has to look at- uh, To look at the network. East Ave, the yeah. corridor, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it is in the long term plans to look at that intersection of uh, East Ave and East Wall and that mess that's there now. So I think that's that's definitely on the long term plans. Yeah, I just don't know if we wanted to if there's an opportunity here for uh, a condition of approval to help with some of those funding of those crosswalks would be the thing. Just yeah, I can put some uh, while you guys are you know working on your deliberations. I'll type something up. Okay. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, Mike here. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I am just really excited that I moved to Norwalk 25 years ago, and now I'm going to be living in a college town, <laughs> which has always been my dream. And I didn't really have to do much about it. Uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, I, I am going to uh, divulge my vote in support now and just say that this is a very exciting uh, thing for Norwalk. Uh, certainly the arts are always a benefit to any community, but I think this is the beginning of something really awesome for the city. And uh, so it's going to have my full support. 
Well, don't forget that NCC has always been here, so we've always been in the college town. Oh, you're right. Thank but. you. Thank you, JJ. I, I take it a step further. NCC was begun by Norwalkers. It was a Norwalk initiative. It was not initiated uh, by the state of Connecticut, but by Norwalk residents. Well, I always consider, to be fair, I always considered it a state school. I don't know why, but it, it you know, and that it was suburban campus. I know they originally had an urban campus in South Norwalk. They were at the, uh, you know, Wilson Avenue down there in yeah. that really cool building, which I hope that becomes something education related eventually too. It's going to be across the street from the new South Norwalk school. But I divulge. Um, so yes, we were a college town, but I mean, uh, to have a downtown campus on Wall Street and with that infrastructure that's there and then with the millions that's proposed to be spent on uh, pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure uh, that's gotten a lot of press in the last few months, uh, that's, all, uh, th that's all pretty exciting. So I think this is part of the formula of, for placemaking and how to, uh, you know, create vibrant downtowns is certainly uh, education is a big part of it. So uh, I think that's great, and uh, and I'm sure there will be partnerships eventually with NCC. But isn't NCC been renamed or something? Isn't it, doesn't it have a new name? I thought it got renamed or something recently. Maybe, but we don't have to take our time to this evening <laughs> to discuss that. Well, we should all be corrected if uh, we're calling it the wrong name. Anyway, thanks. Uh, any uh, any other comments before we close the hearing? Uh, I see a lot of head shaking. Yeah, I have, um, sorry. Go ahead, Anna. Just off for a second. Um, so, so they're gonna start uh, this year, I guess, or, or um, they're gonna start their first year. And then for their second year, there's gonna be a second class coming in and you don't have a building identified for the second year students if i'm correct with that i guess my question is like how do you know that you'll be able to get another dorm building sort of walking distance from where the the campus is we um, have selected a building um okay. yeah we, we 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 are um we have selected a building and um we do have the financing for it um, and it is uh in walking distance of campus as well Wonderful. And then my second question is, I mean, what, what happens if somebody brings a car and parks it somewhere else? How would you know? Or if you find out, are they expelled or, or disciplinary proceeding for having a car? Um, I'm not familiar with sort of rules like this. Sure. How does that work? So so if if they're parking in public parking, they're they're public. You know that's where they're parking. If if they're parking at the dormitories, um, they they have to have um, a medical reason. Otherwise, uh, their car will get towed. Um, we have a so, resident advisor on campus to 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 check. So it's not that they're not allowed to have a car. It's that they're not allowed to park it in the dormitory park. Yeah, yes, that, 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 that's, that's correct. We, we can't tell anyone not to have a car. That's, you know, I can't force anyone not to have a car there. If someone has a car, they have a car, um, but they can't park it. There, there's no parking uh, anywhere near. I mean, given that, given that so many are out of state and students, I think there's a fairly reasonable chance that there wouldn't be a ton of them with cars, but my initial understanding was that they wouldn't be allowed to bring cars. And now my understanding is more that just, you will not be providing parking spaces for people who may or may not have cars. And that's quite different. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we I don't think legally we can, um, you know, dictate whether someone is allowed to have a car or not. Um, you know, but in terms of uh, our facilities and, and where they're parking, we can say you, you can't park here. Um, I think that's, uh, I could be wrong, um, but legally I think that's all we're allowed to uh, to tell them. So then even if 
And I understand that like maybe you're required to provide half a space per dorm, so 24 spaces or something, even if you have whatever 24 spaces available. I guess that's I guess that's a question. Do you have parking spaces available? And then you're 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 almost by default like instructing students, uh, please go park in the neighborhood. It it's a little bizarre, yeah. Um, I don't. I don't believe so. No, um, we do have six no. spots available, um, and uh, it is it is not customary for any school to have uh, first year students have cars. Um, uh, in my experience at, at universities, it is incredibly rare that students have cars unless they are commuting or they're local. Um, we we just don't really see that very often, uh, especially as these students are going to be auditioning in New York City. We imagine quite often they're going to be using East Norwalk in that train station. Um, so we 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 really really don't anticipate um, them bringing cars. Thank you. Those were my questions. All right. Uh, anything else before we um, close the hearing? All right. If not, uh, then uh, this uh, public hearing is uh, is closed, and uh, we'll move on to action. <clears throat> uh, we we have uh, two actions. Um, we need uh, to take them uh, individually. Um, my guess is there's no point uh in approving uh the um <laughs> the wall street facility unless uh, there's a dormitory for the students so i'm going to suggest uh we deal with uh with that item uh first um and again uh, that is a proposed dormitory uh use within an existing building for students of the NOAA Conservatory of Arts. Uh, comments from commission members on that? I would think the vote would have to go on the school first. The, oh, did I get it backwards? The, the dorm is, yeah, the dorm is dependent on, on the school being a school. Actually, they're dependent on one another, are they not? No, I, I don't think the school has to have a dormitory. They want one, but... I don't know that they have to, though. Okay, I see. I saw Steve um, uh, nodding his head. He might have warned me in advance, but that's fine. Um, we'll take uh, uh, the um, uh, the Conservatory uh, of Arts at one hundred two. Um, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, the proposed uh, conservatory at uh, sixty nine Wall Street. Uh, as uh, the first item. Um, I think uh, maybe we ought to uh, start with um, some of the comments that were uh, recently made. This is a request for a, um, a special permit, and there are uh, 13 items uh, that we need to uh, consider. Uh, for any uh, special permit, the first being density and use and bulk uh, of the building. Uh, Steve, was that your hand going up? Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so for the so if you're going to take action on the Wall Street um, change in use application first, um, that one the special permit criteria don't apply to since it's not a special permit application. So that would be more. Oh, that that one is simply interior changes. Yeah, and I think to be honest with you, in all fairness, when we rewrote the, the central business district regulations, this really should not have been a, a site plan use. It probably, since it was, it would have lined up more appropriately as a change of use with no change in parking, probably would have been something, a simpler process for them, but you know, just the way it, it worked out. Well, will we then be approving it as a uh, site plan review? Um, or a simple approval? Uh, yes, let me, I can pull up the resolution for you that's got that all laid out. One second. Steve, while you're looking that up, uh, Mr. Chairman, would you mind if I ask the applicant a question? We've closed the hearing, Richard, I'm sorry. 
Um, Yeah, so this is the resolution for 69 wall. Um, it is a site plan review. I did add a condition for the East Avenue one I, for regarding the TMP question, but I'll get, deal with that one after you guys take action on, on this one. <clears throat> Can you move it down, Steve? Sure. So this. Oh, oh well, the second the one is the dormitory. Right. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm ready to. Why don't we have a, why don't we do a motion to approve and then we can look at the. And discuss the. Can I take that as a motion? Um, I'll make a motion to approve, approve Galen. Okay. Yes. Galen has moved. Is there a second? That's the resolution. I'll second. All right. Nick has uh, seconded. Uh, Galen, did you want to comment on this? Well, I think it's a really good project. It's very exciting. I think everything Mike said is true. Um, Norwalk is a wonderful place for that. We're right outside of New York City, which is a real nexus of uh, the Broadway performing arts, obviously, Broadway being in New York City. Uh, there are also more and more movies being shot in Connecticut as there are in, in New York. So um, Norwalk is a wonderful place to have a performing arts school like this. And I think we're lucky to have it. We'll be lucky to have it. So I'm in favor of it. <laughs> Other so, I, myself, so I'm going to motion to approve this, please. Pardon me? I said I'd muted myself. So I'm motioning to approve, uh, approve, the, approve this. Uh, we have a motion to approve it. We already have a motion on the floor to approve it. Beautiful. So I'll second it then. I'm sorry. Who's speaking? It's Brian Clark Jr. Yeah, you're not a member of the commission. You're, you're right. You speaking. you play no role in this. I'm sorry. Nah, maybe next year. Uh, uh, other comments? Um, no. I think the only outstanding thing is the if they get accredited and we'll deal with it then. It seems. Right. Okay, then Lou, let's. I, Lou, I'd just like to say, I, I think it's an exciting project and possibility for the city of Norwalk. And I also think that it's a, a shame that we didn't approve the Schoolhouse Academy because once again, that would have been a feather in Norwalk's cap. Thank you. Okay, um, Steve, uh, let's do a roll call on this. Sure, and I'm, I'm just who is seated as the alternate. I'm I just Chapin is still is still seated. Okay, very good. So I'll start with Chapin. Approve. Uh, Mr. Rowena. Yes, I hope um, Mr. Loftus George has a, has good luck with the state of Connecticut getting his approval before August. But yes, Mr. Mushak. An enthusiastic yes. Miss Wells. Yes. Ms. Langallis? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Mr. Cantor? Yes. Ms. Jordan Byron? Yes. And Mr. Shulman? Yes. That's unanimous. Okay. So um, that, uh, that motion is uh, approved. Uh, for the second one, um, I'd like to uh, seat uh, Hector Pachas, but I don't, I no longer see Hector uh, among those present. Am I missing something? It um, seems he's jumped off. I, I don't see him either, but is, is Anna now available? No, I, 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 we're not, we're not going to seat uh, Anna. This I'm time. not, I'm not driving anymore, just so you know. 
just got home. <laughs> um, I'll be back at my computer in like five minutes. All right, we'll we'll uh, look into seating you for the next item uh, after this um, second vote. Um, we'll, uh, in the absence of uh, Hector, we'll keep uh, Mr. Bryce seated uh, for uh, the second item. And uh, the second item, uh, the proposed dormitory use within existing building for students uh, of the Norwalk uh, Conservatory of Arts. This is where, um, uh, because, uh, because this is indeed a, a, a special permit, um, we should um, run through the requirements of the special permit um, just to make sure that we're comfortable um, that um, uh, they meet these requirements. And the first of those is uh, density uh, and uh, bulk of the uh, building. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there's really no uh, proposed change other than the uh, change in uh, the use uh, of uh, uh, the building. Uh, stable uh, traffic flow, considering that um, the uh, students will not have uh, cars on the property, um, I, I don't believe uh, that to uh, be an issue. Um, uh, availability of uh, mass transit facilities uh, and provision of sidewalks. There are uh, sidewalks uh, and um, there are, uh, I believe, two bus routes uh, that operate uh, on um, uh, East Avenue. Uh, availability and compatibility of uh, utilities. Um, uh, apparently, there is um, um, an issue, I believe, with the water service, which uh, Mr. Loftus George has indicated they're in the process of resolving. Um, adverse impact from uh, noise, odor, fumes, dust, and uh, artificial uh, lighting. Um, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Loftus George has indicated that uh, there will be a staff member uh, at uh, the facility um, to uh, address those issues. Um, signs, uh, signs of size and design that are in harmony. Um, is, uh, at least at this point, there's no signage uh, being proposed. Uh, the adequacy of yards and open space. Um, uh, the applicant apparently is exploring to expand um, and uh, provide uh, um, uh, such space. Um, impact on uh, neighborhood properties. Uh, there is actually support uh, from um, the neighborhood organization, two, two neighborhood uh, uh, organizations. Um, exist, existing land use in the area, um, residences uh, are not inconsistent <clears throat> with uh, the uses on um, uh, East, uh, East Avenue. Uh, and we have changed uh, the zoning to permit uh, a dormitory. And uh, proximity of uh, community facilities, um, City Hall, the Health Department, uh, the Historical Society, Mill Hill um, um, are all within a, a short walk uh, of uh, the facility. And uh, compliance with the zoning code and particularly the plan of, of uh, conservation and development, uh, this is a uh, priority in uh, uh, the plan of conservation and development. Uh, conservation of wetlands, water courses, uh, and other ecologically uh, valuable lands. Uh, this really isn't uh, uh, applicable, even though it's relatively near to uh, the Norwalk River. And uh, as far as we understand, there are no zoning violations. So I, I think in terms of uh, the items we need to look at uh, for a, a special permit, it um, meets our uh, requirements. 
um, on uh, uh, that basis, um, uh, I certainly would be willing to vote in favor uh, of uh, the project. Um, any other comments from commission members? I okay. have uh, just a comment. Go ahead, Go ahead Richard. I'm sorry. Uh, I have a comment to make. Um, I thought Diane CC um, raised some good points. Um, and one of them was the possibility of Ubers and, and food delivery. And like you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Wong was my doctor as well. And having sat in that waiting room with the 80 other people that are in there, I'm sure um, that that won't be any more of an impact than the traffic that went in and out of there at that time. So I agree with all of what you had to say, but I just wanted to add that as well. Thank you. Anything else? All right, if not, um, are there any changes? Can you pull up the resolution, Steve? Steve, uh, uh, what do you propose we do about number three? Uh, yeah, I was afraid you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I have a number. I, I think I would just be, be honest. I would be completely pulling it out of thin air. Um, right. Uh, it might want to rethink rewording that to have it, no personal vehicles unless, uh, as the applicant indicated, as required for uh, emergency purposes, for you know ADA purposes or something along those lines. Okay, I I think that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Right. Um. And or do we go to the vehicles? I mean, doesn't that refer to the to the student vehicles, not faculty vehicles? I think that's right. I think if there's going to be a staff person sleeping there, um, they will indeed be um, uh, coming and using a car. This is the dorm, so I'm not assuming faculty is coming to the dorm other than the RA or so, right? So that you assume faculty is going to be at the at the educational spots. Right. I don't know if I'm allowed to speak. No. Yeah, I'm yes. sorry. Sorry. You're not. Sorry. Yeah. sorry. I'm so sorry. Got it. What if you just limit it to the number of parking spaces and be done with it? It's like the school can figure out what what did he, what did we say? There's 16 parking spaces there. The first 16 students that have a car, that's it. Done. So no more than 16 vehicles no, parking. Site I worry time. that creates a weird perverse incentive of like first rights in or students starting to fight first going with the ADA element and then you're you don't have to worry about that, you know. Could we not leave expand? it? Then? Oh, sorry. Uh, Nick, and are you done, Nick? Yeah. All right. Okay. Could we not uh, just leave it to comply with our zoning regs? Steve? Yeah, that, that's a very eloquent option, I think. So, who, Darius, you're just suggesting eliminate three. Yeah, why not? Good idea. Okay. All right. Is six the last one we have? No, I added. Okay. Um, I added Good. number nine, which was the um, that Mr. Cantor was talking about um, speaking with the TMP before they get started. So I added that in there if that's acceptable works for me. And then in Michelle's memo, it mentioned that the applicant said they would be uh, open to planting street, uh, street trees and whatnot. Do we need that as a condition as well? Was that this application or the other one? Yeah, um, it, was, it was this one. It was on, if you look in the memo, it was talking about the buffering. Uh, hold on, I have it here.
sorry. Oh, impact. So under, what is it, page two, three of the memo that Michelle sent. It said impact to neighborhood properties as right. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, and then it's point seven, adequacy of yard open space. Applicant is exploring to expand more green open spaces on the site since it's over park. Applicant agreed to install treats, street trees. Wow, I, I think that's that the one. other. I think that's the other restav application because that oh. that one was Michelle's. But I did put a condition in that covers that either this is way. 110? Is this not 110? No, no, no. That's a different. That's next. Oh, I'm looking at the, sorry. Yeah, no, this is 102. 102, sorry. Yeah, but I added in uh, number 10 if you wanted to add that in, if that was acceptable to the individual who made the motion. So I don't think made a motion with this yet. Similarly, did we want to um, add a condition to explore solar? I think the applicant was open to that. It was one of the things we came uh, spoke about tonight. Good call, Chief. Okay, um, Galen, um, you indicated we didn't have, uh, we don't have a motion on this yet? Yeah, right, we don't have a motion on the floor. So I'll move that we ex uh, approve it and use this resolution. To okay, uh, Galen moves, is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Richard, was that you who spoke yes. up? Okay, Richard seconded. Uh, any uh, further uh, comments or questions? If not, let's go to a roll call vote. Certainly, um, Mr. Rowena. Yes. Ms. Jordan Byron. Yes. Ms. Lingalis. Yes. Mr. Cantor. Yes. Mr. Williams? He's All right, maybe lost him. Ms. Wells? Yes. Mr. Mushak? Yes, and I think his uh, computer, Darius's computer died. He's getting back on, so. <laughs> okay, we'll see where he comes in. Uh, Mr. Bryce? Yes. Um, and we could go with Mr. Shulman? Yes. That more than passes regardless of uh, where Mr. Williams is going. Okay, do you want to call? I think you can call it, Mr. Chairman. Um, here's Darius. Oh. Did we get to the vote yet? Yes, yeah, we, we did. did. What would Just your vote be? Yes or no? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, it's unanimous. Thank it's you, Darius. Sorry about that. Technology. <laughs> okay, good. It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Let's move on uh, to uh, the next public hearing. Um, and that's one that's 2023-24 uh, SP, uh, 110, 114 East Avenue, Norwalk Associates, LLC, uh, District 1, Block 55, Lot Number 2, Proposed Historic Preservation of 13 Units in Office uh, within two existing buildings. Um, Attorney Suchi, are you representing the uh, owner? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I am. Okay, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Liz Suchi. I'm a partner at Carmody Torrance, Sandeck and Hennessy, 1055 Washington Boulevard in Stamford. And I represent the owner of the property and that is 110-114 East Avenue, Norwalk Associates, LLC. Present with me this evening, <clears throat> excuse me, is Maxwell Crowley. He is um, a member of the owner, along with David Pinto, professional ear, a professional engineer with Redness and Mead, who prepared both the updated site plan and the recreation plan that has been submitted and distributed. The applications for special permit and CAM were submitted to the city on April 24th. 
Neighbors were notified of the submission by certificate of mailing on May 2nd, and the certificate of mailing was submitted to the staff and is a part of your permanent file. Neighbors were notified of tonight's public hearing by certified mail return receipt requested on end regular mail on May 24th. And this morning I delivered a packet of the green cards that have been received to date, along with copies of the letters for which the green cards have not yet been received. And Attorney Sachi, may I interrupt you for one second? I apologize. Um, I wanted, uh, uh, we're going to uh, seat uh, Anna Tabachnik for this public hearing and um, we'll, we'll have to unseat Mr. Bryce. My apologies. No, no apology necessary. So the applicant, as I mentioned before, is 110-114 East Avenue, Norwalk Associates. Uh, the address is 110-114 East Avenue. The zone is the East Avenue Village District. The lot size is approximately 0.58 of an acre and it is District 1, Block 55, Lot 52. Perhaps at this time, um, Mr. Crowley, if you could possibly screen share photos that you took yesterday and then again today for those commissioners who may not be familiar with the site, just like to get them up in front of you and take a look to see what we're talking about. The property is currently improved with two structures and approximately 28 parking spaces. It is used for multifamily and office and has been used in that capacity for many years. There are about 11 units, 12 uh, residential units plus office space existing between the two structures. 114 East Avenue, which is the two and a half story large um, residential structure was constructed around 1855. It has center and side chimneys, multi-dormered roof, a front door with transom, a wide front gable roof line and jerk and head uh, side gables. Um, that's a photo of the rear recreation area that's been expanded and I'll get to that in just a minute, but that will be the recreation area for the residents that's been improved and updated um, just as of yesterday. Uh, the early owners of the um, 1855 building were both Mary, Henry and Mary Brooks who lived there with their daughter, Emma and her children. And then later a gentleman named Carl Alstrom who was a lace manufacturer and he lived there with his wife, Marion, their three ch children and some staff. Norwalk, as many of you may know, had a large lace manufacturing industry at that time and into the early 1900s. And that industry was largely situated at Muller Park, which is up Route 7 off Perry Avenue. There are six residential units in the two and a half story building. It is listed on the city's National Register of Historic Places, but it is not listed on the state inventory or the national inventory of historic places. The smaller one story building that it fronts um, on East Avenue and is to the south of the historic building. That was constructed around 1955. That's the, the one that's right there in front of you. That's the Alstrom building, I'll call it, uh, the historic structure built in 1855. Okay. Okay, there's an image taken yesterday. The building that where it says Physical Therapy Associates, that structure was constructed in around 1950. It has six has uh, five residential units, and some ground level office space. It was physical therapy associates and others. Uh, the driveway on the north side of the property comes around the back of both buildings. And on the back of this, the physical therapy associates building, which is for, we call it that, uh, there are residential units down behind in the back. Um, we propose to, the special permit application is proposed so we can increase the number of residential units from 11 to 13. Multifamily is permitted in the East Avenue Village District. We're not proposing any new structures. We're not proposing the demolition of any structures. We're not proposing um, anything that will change the exterior of these two structures. They will remain as is. The only change is that there will be 13 residential units as opposed to 11 and some small office space as well. Two units will be dedicated as workforce housing units in accordance with section 118.1050 of the zoning regulation. The parking on site complies fully with the requirements for the zone. The recreation area has been increased to achieve compliance with the East Avenue Village District Zone. All landscaping is to remain. And as per staff's directive uh, suggestion, two street trees were installed yesterday. And you can see one of them in this image uh, to, to the, there you go. There's one more. We've you can see the two tree trees. Right there, they're on the left and the right of the walkway that leads up from the sidewalk on East Avenue to the front door of the 114 East Avenue building. Um, we propose no other changes to the landscaping, it will remain as is, and it's uh, rather nicely landscaped uh, today and will continue as such. We have received sign-offs from all SEAC agencies, 
such as DPW, Fire, WPCA, First District, and the Health Department all reviewed the plans and that were submitted. Some of these agencies had questions and comments for additional information. For example, the WPCA wanted us to provide information on sewer and water usage, and we provided that. Those have all signed off on this proposal. We received no responses from TMP since the application was submitted six weeks ago, nor in response to a follow-up email from me last week. Uh, the Historical Commission was scheduled to hold a hearing on this proposal on May 24th. The hearing was open, but the commission experienced significant, significant technical dif difficulties uh, and IT issues, so the meeting had to conclude and has not yet been rescheduled. That, generally speaking, is what we are proposing in a nutshell. If you'd like, we can, you can certainly um, see the site plan or the recreation area plan. Uh, Mr. Pinto is here to answer any questions that you might have from a site planning perspective. But again, there are no changes to the structures, no changes to the site, with the exception of creating additional recreation space in the back. The site is served by city sewer and water and will continue to be, continue to be so. And it is fully compliant in terms of parking that's required and the two workforce housing units will be provided in accordance with requirements of the workforce housing regulations. Um, I have nothing else to add at this point. Uh, we, we haven't heard from any neighbors. I haven't gotten a call or an email or um, any inquiry from neighbors. Um, I don't know if the city has, but if you have any questions of me or Mr. Crowley or Mr. Pinto, we'd be happy to answer them and look forward to hearing any comments from the public. Uh, Attorney Suchi, um, how are you accommodating the um... Uh, two additional units? Those will be, uh, they're going to be retrofitted inside the building. There is no construction required to create those. They'll just be units that had been, one unit will be created into two, but it's interior renovation that of course will need to go to the building department to get those approvals to create those units. Okay. And is uh, the larger building, the historic building, um, has that been modified uh, at all over the years? I suspect there have been slight modifications, but since my client has owned the structure for several years, there have been no exterior modifications to the building. And many of the features still exist, such as the, the chimneys and the, the transom in front and the jerkin head gables, which is a word I had no idea what it meant, but I found out that that was a popular feature in the 18th and 19th century. So the building is similar to what it looked like when it was originally created, probably some modifications over time, but not since my client has owned it. Uh, other questions for Attorney Suchi? Two things I might add, Mr. Chairman, if you would allow me. We had asked for a waiver of a traffic report since the increase was just one to two units and there are sufficient sight lines along East Avenue looking north and south and sufficient parking on site to accommodate all of the units, including the two to be created. We also requested that a complete um, architectural historical analysis of the structures be waived since we are not proposing any new structures to which we would need to show compatibility. Um, and since we're not proposing any exterior changes to either of them, and I would ask that the commission consider that as uh, consider that request and not require my client to undergo the time and expense to provide information that I think in large measure we've already provided. Other than that, we have nothing further to add at this point, unless you have questions of me, Mr. Crowley or Mr. Pinto. Uh, am I correct? Um in uh, uh, assuming uh, that you're not asking for anything here, um, uh, or any sp uh, a special consideration due to the historic uh, nature of the building itself? The only request is to increase the density from that which is allowed currently. That's the reason why we had to provide, we had to submit a special permit application because the density doesn't uh, match the density normally required in the East Avenue Village District. So under your regulations, we are allowed to seek, um, um, for lack of a better word, a variance or an exceedance of density among other types of height and bulk requirements. But density is the only provision uh, requirement in this zone that is not uh, satisfied. So that is the reason why we're before you with the special permit under your East Avenue Village District historic structure provision. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Lou, if I may. Sure. Thank you. Good evening, Attorney Suchi. Um, do you happen to know, or the owners, if the brick structure was ever a motel? 
has sort of that look about it? Um, I don't believe it was. Um, maybe Mr. Crowley knows, but I'm, I don't believe it was. I can't answer that. Um, I, I don't know. Um, to, to our knowledge, it was never a motel um, when we acquired the building. Um, the use uh, the, for that space was mainly offices, um, attorneys, therapists, small office spaces. Oh, okay, thank you. And then um, I know you own the building. Did you consider instead of having these units be rentals did you consider selling them for condominiums it might be a nice possibility for people to own something that's small and affordable since the square footage on many of these are on the smaller side compared to what's being built nowadays sure um you know we've never considered it um anything's really possible in the real estate business it's it's certainly a good consideration um, we've had, you know, with the, with the rentals, we've been able to really secure some wonderful tenants at a rate that is affordable for them. Um, but condos is certainly something we could consider down the road, but nothing we've considered at this time. Okay. And do you have any idea what your rents will be? Uh, the rents, it really just depends on the, on the footprint. Um, but our rents are at market rate for what this area of um, East Avenue trades for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. One other thing, uh, Commissioner Langalis, just in looking through my notes very quickly, and I'm sorry for the rustling of papers, it does appear that that structure had always been in some way, shape or form a commercial with some residential, but I, don't, I didn't see anything in my notes and documents that I had that indicated it was a motel or multifamily residential from the outset. There has always been some sort of um, office or commercial component to it. <clears throat> but this would, with what we're planning, it would be these, the structure would be, structures would be more in keeping with the other multifamily residential structures on East Avenue. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Uh, if not, um, we will uh, open it up uh, to uh, the public for comment. Sure. If there's anyone from the public who wishes to speak, uh, you can use the raise your hand function. At the bottom of the screen, there is one individual with a telephone. And again, that is star nine to raise your hand via phone. Okay, just uh, to remind those who wish to speak, um, please give us your name and uh, your address. Is there no one there? There was a hand up for a second and then it disappeared. Okay, then we will uh, turn it back to uh, Attorney Suchi. Thank you, Mr. Shulman, members of the commission again. Uh, we believe that the proposal before you is a, a reasonable and appropriate use and a reasonable and appropriate request. We are confident that this proposal complies with all of the requirements of the special permit standards of review set forth in section 118.14.50, which include density and bulk of buildings, stable traffic flow, availability of mass transit facilities, um, and as noted in our application, two wheels bus bus routes travel either directly in front of the property or very close by and the East Norwalk train station is within a 15 minute walking distance. The site is uh, served by city water and city, city sewer. Both DPW and WPCA have issued their sign off. Uh, we don't believe there'll be any adverse impact from noise, dust or vibration caused by the uh, construction to be needed to create the units on the interior. No signage is proposed. We believe the yards and open space are adequate, comply with the requirements. In addition, two additional trees have been planted in the front at the staff's suggestion. Um, the East Avenue Village District uh, is 
uh, replete with other similar uses, whether they be uh, residential, office, multifamily, uh, houses of worship, other existing land uses in the area include uh, the city municipal building, Momquist Field, um, other uh, religious institutions, med medical offices and the like, and this is certainly com uh, compatible with those uses. Uh, community facilities are close by across the street within walking distance, and those range from the uh, Momquist Field to Norwalk Historical Society, City Hall, the Norwalk Concert Hall, the Norwalk Inn. <clears throat> The proposal complies with the advisory plan of conservation and development. There are no wetlands, water courses, or other ecologically viable lands on the property. And lastly, there are no zoning violations on the property. Moreover, we submit to you that the proposal complies with section 118, 500B, 2P, little i through little seven, or VII. And I won't go through all of those, but we listed those in our application. And we're confident that this application and the proposal complies with all of those. We would ask that you grant the, app, the application tonight, uh, approve, the, uh, approve it as is, and we look forward to making this property continue to be vibrant and provide uh, much needed housing and affordable units in City Norwalk. That's it. Okay. Uh, any uh, uh, final questions for uh, Attorney Sechi? Um, one thing I forgot. There was a suggestion by staff to consider solar. Um, and I think two reasons that we would ask that you revisit that and, and not impose that as a condition. The 1855 building doesn't really have a lot of space and I think it would impact its architectural history and, it, and the um, uh, impact the integrity of that building by installing solar on such an, an older and uh, well-maintained building of that, that era. And as far as the smaller building, there are various, um, as you see from the aerial, uh, air conditioning units on the roof that don't allow for a great array of uh, solar panels. Uh, and with the remaining roof facing the other side more north, um, I think that would not be beneficial from a uh, solar generation standpoint and certainly be an, an economic burden to the applicant who is only before you to create two new units on the inside. I think that coupled with the fact that the rear of the property is being improved with additional recreation space, that's just uh, that where now there's, there's little, it's going to be a, a more vibrant and um, pleasant place for the residents to gather. I'd like to think that that would be more valuable to this site and to these residents than trying to install a few sol solar panels that may not be beneficial to the site or gain what we need to gain out of uh, solar panels that could be installed on larger structures. Clearly, the, the building that is 1855, I don't think that's, that would be appropriate for solar panels on such a large, um, such a historic structure. And that's my only comment. Anna, you have a question? Yes, I had a question. Um, I, I didn't quite hear, maybe I missed it, how many parking spaces there are. That's the, I understand that it complies with the requirements. I was just curious how many parking spaces there are. Um, and if you're not adding additional spaces for these two new apartments, do you know sort of from experience that they don't all tend to get used already? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I believe we have 28 parking spaces right now, and uh, a few of them are going to be removed. I believe it's three to create the recreation area. So we're going to have an excess of 24, 25 parking spaces, which is more than sufficient for 13 units. Um, the times that I've driven in the back, not all of them have been occupied, but I can't tell you that they are, they were, are never all unoccupied, but there are more than sufficient spaces for 13 units. Thank There's you. 20, 25. Uh, is there anything else before we close the hearing? All right. Uh, if not, uh, we'll close the hearing and uh, we'll move on to uh, action. Um, Steve, uh, can we put up uh, the uh, proposed resolution? I had it and I lost it. Just give me one <laughs> second. Okay.
Sorry, one second. Uh, is there a motion to um, approve this uh, draft resolution? I'm sorry, motion to approve. Okay, JJ uh, has moved to approve. Is there a second? I'll I'll second. second. And Nick, Nick has uh, seconded. Um, uh, I, there is absolutely no requirement um, here for the applicant to uh, have uh, done a full and proper analysis of the uh, historic structure. Um, nonetheless, I'm disappointed that they haven't. Um, would not be terribly difficult to compare perhaps um, old uh, pictures of the building compared to what it looks like today to uh, determine um, it's a true historic uh, value, and if if necessary, to possibly consider uh, changes to bring it back to uh, what it was when it was originally constructed. Uh, however, that is not required here for the special permit, so I can't uh, consider it. Um, I just wanted to express my frustration with that given that it is as old as it is. Um, are we ready to vote on this or are there further comments? Can we scroll to see the rest of the... <laughs> Thank you, Nick. No worries. I'm ready to, to vote on it. Shall we vote? Um, what well, do we want? What do we want to do about number six? Right. I mean, I, uh, looking at uh, uh, the number uh, of uh, roofs, um, and as as Attorney Suchi said, considering um, the um, historic value of the building, uh, I would tend to agree with her that. Um, for these two extra units, it 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 may not be reasonable for us to sure, but shouldn't we just it's written in such a way that it leaves it open to what makes sense, right? Like I can be convinced that the on the historical with all the gables, you can't put anything on it. And mm -hmm. I could I have no way to know whether the flat side of the other structure is actually viable or not. So I'd rather see if they, what can be done and we go from there versus give it away for first take it off the table yeah and this talks about the parking lot right Th number six as well yeah yeah i i'd like to see the language um uh, modified because it says nothing um um, about uh, uh, the cost that I mean, it may be possible to cover the parking lot uh, with uh, solar panels, uh, but it may also be prohibitively uh, expensive. And that doesn't, you're saying, all you're saying is a feasibility report. I'm not, I'm not sure that goes far enough. How would it go further? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, sorry, Galen. What I meant is that it goes uh, too far. Um, again, what we're talking about is a request to add um, two apartments to an existing uh, building, um, and um, 
the costs of uh, installing uh, solar, uh, particularly um, solar units over a, a parking area, um, are quite expensive and extraordinarily expensive, it seems to me, in relation uh, the, to the cost of, um, uh, of and, and um, revenue from building uh, two additional apartments. Perhaps this is an example of why it would be good for us to have our round table with people that can give us more information on solar than rather than us kind of guesstimating. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I, you know, I don't yeah. know if this plays into it, but we're talking about a historic building and then we're putting a solar parking lot in the back. I mean, it could be an interesting uh, juxtaposition or on the, on the other hand, it could look totally out of place. Steve, in the original yes. um, resolution, there were eight things. Did you delete something though? Or you kept them all there? I didn't edit this uh, one at all. That's actually, this one's a PDF. So okay, thank you. All right. You know, the, number six just says to the extent possible. You know, so I don't think it's, you know, we're asking that people look at it. That's all. You know, with the parking lot, we have no idea. Would it be possible? What is it too expensive? Is it, you know, whatever. So leaving it in at least means that the applicant has to explore it, come up with, yeah, it is possible, we'll do it, or no, it isn't feasible for these reasons. I'm I'm not going to let this stand in the way of of uh, approving this, um, but I do think that in in the case of this request, it goes um, too far. Uh, that's that's my view. Um, Sorry, Steve, what happened, the, the copy that I'm looking at has the applicant work with TMP to implement and address the department's comments made on 4-18-23. I don't see that here. Yeah, and I think that's in error, right? Because I, I think as attorney such, you said that TMP didn't comment. So I'm not positive about why that was worded that way, to be honest with you. Okay, so I just feel like I have the wrong amount of resolutions on the one that I'm looking at, so never mind. I'll just look at yours, but <laughs> it's different. But that's the only thing that I can find that's different. All right. Um, are you ready to um, vote on uh, the resolution? Yep. Do we have a Yes, we have. You have a motion. I believe we have a. Yeah, I I motion. Right. Oh yeah. JJ, JJ yeah. moved, and I think Nick seconded. Yeah. Thank you. S sorry. Okay. All right. Let's do a roll call. Okay, and I'm, I apologize again. Who uh, who is seated uh, as the alternate? I'm sorry. Um, Anna is seated on this. All right. We'll start with Anna. Miss Tabachnik. Yes. Ms. Lane Gallis? Yes. Ms. Jordan Byron? Yes. Mr. Cantor? Yes. Mr. Rowena? Yes. Ms. Wells? Yes. Mr. Mushak? Yes. Uh, Mr. Williams? Yes. And Mr. Shulman? Yes. That one also is unanimous. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time tonight. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we'll move on to uh, the final uh, public hearing. And I see Mr. Pachas is uh, back with us. I'm going to uh, unseat Han uh, Anna and um, 
uh, reseat Mr. Uh, Pachas for this um, uh, <clears throat> final final public hearing. Mr. Shulman? Yes. Would it be possible to have a five minute break? Uh, yeah. I was thinking that uh, as soon as we finish this, we take a 10 minute break oh, okay. uh, before, <laughs> before we go into our uh, uh, discussion. I, there are a lot of people waiting. Oh, okay, um, sorry. And I'm so I, you know, I think rather than the 15 minute break, the 10 minute break, but uh that that's a natural break right there when we finish the public hearings. Okay, thank you. Um, this is 2023-28 CAM 300 Wilson Avenue LLC, 310 Wilson Avenue conversion of a 16,000 square square foot portion of an existing warehouse and office space to a recreational turf field. Uh, and uh, I believe since I see attorney Blank that you are representing the applicant. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Adam Blank for the applicant that live uh, here in Norwalk. Um, so 300 Wilson Avenue is the applicant, although the property is located at 310 Wilson Avenue. Um, it's about six, a little over six and a half acres. Uh, start with the site here. Um, and, and we've submitted the green cards and uh, with me on the call are Kevin Conroy, um, who's one of the owners of the property. And I believe we've got Jason Kramalski and Vito Luciano, one or more of them who are the operators of the um, ice house and of the uh, proposed uh, turf addition. So uh, again, so 310 Wilson Avenue is here. Um, the, the Sono ice house is the the main building on the property. Um, you may remember I was actually in front of you, I feel like it was maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago on this site where we were putting in a go green dry cleaner in one of the other two buildings that are on the same property. But in the main building, which is where the ice house is located, um, if uh, many people who've been in there don't actually realize, but that, that whole space is not the ice house. Um, there are office users in part of the space. It's two levels. There's uh, warehouse users, um, and the ice house um, uh, doesn't, you know, occupies just a, a portion of the building. Um, it's zoned industrial too. You have that main warehouse. It's a little over 100,000 square feet. You've got a 21,000 square foot building here and a 5,000 uh, square foot boathouse building uh, here. It's on Village Creek. And so even though we're really doing, it's just an interior fit up and change of use, um, but it triggers a, a public hearing and a CAM site plan application because of the proximity to uh, Village Creek. Um, and so as you heard, the proposal is to uh, uh, convert some of the warehouse space in the building, and I'll show you that in a second, uh, about 16,000 square foot to uh, indoor turf. Um, and um, you may be familiar with the um, ice house. Uh, I'm sorry, not the ice house, the Sono uh, field house, um, which was you know just uh, a few blocks away. And that that property was uh, sold and the field house uh, is no longer, that was a, a turf building, you know, indoor turf for lacrosse and indoor soccer. Um, it was converted to a, a rubberized surface on just about the entirety of the interior, not quite all of it, um, and transition to a volleyball facility. Um, and because of that, that, and that, by the way, was the only indoor turf facility in Norwalk, um, and it displaced all of the, the, the youth lacrosse and soccer uh, programming that was happening there is now spread to just a couple of other locations throughout Fairfield County. So, the ice house uh, would like to step in and, and partially fill that um, void by expanding that uh, rec commercial recreational use, which is permitted uh, uh, for this uh, site. Um, they would like to take what is currently three warehouse sections, totaling 16,000 square feet, convert that to turf. Um, but the turf requires the, the warehouse ceiling height is not ideal for the all of the turf field. So this is the first floor where the where the turf will go. The about 5,000 square feet of office space above will be taken down so that the ceiling height on the floor below can be increased. So in essence, we're taking 
16,000 square feet of warehouse, 5,000 square feet of office, and replacing it with 16,000 square feet of turf. Uh, as a result of that, um, we, we had excess parking, but your parking is, is sort of easily met because again, we're not really expanding square footage, we're actually subtracting square footage. Um, the, uh, the, and I can tell you that we've, the, the operators, you know, in the big picture, the hope is that they're going to be able to actually expand um, into other space or into another building to add additional um, turf. Um, but the, the, they really need uh, to be able to move forward now because there's a fair amount of fit up work that needs to occur to get it all done for the fall enrollment period when the, the sports uh, teams would be signing up. Um, the, uh, I'll stop sharing for a minute. The, the space that's proposed, it's not going to be for um, tournaments or um, games with spectators. It's a practice facility. There will be some dry land practice for the hockey folks, as well as um, some youth uh, lacrosse and soccer and potentially some later in the evening hours of adult uh, use of those uh, turf fields. Um, again, um, the, the only reason we're here for, that we need a public hearing is because of the proximity to Farm Creek. Um, there's no Village, exterior... Village Creek. I'm sorry, <laughs> Village Creek, Village, <laughs> Village Creek, yes. Uh, there's no, um, uh, no adverse effects on coastal resources. Um, the, it complies with your regulations. Um, we, uh, there, there was a few um, questions that came up in the staff uh, memo and with your staff that I, I want to just uh, uh, address with you um, briefly. If I come back to sharing my screen. Um, so one thing that, that there was a, an older aerial um, of uh, what um, I think staff thought, and I what didn't know what it was, but staff thought was salt or some other type of material storage that was going on outside of the ice house in the parking lot that there was concerns would um, uh, leach into uh, the, the waterway. Um, that my understanding and, and the uh, veto can maybe um, correct me if I misstate this at all, but that in the once a year, the ice rinks themselves um, gets very, very significantly shaved down and the ice that comes off the rink is then placed in the parking lot and slowly melts away. Um, and for whatever reason, it there was a picture in here that it, you know one spot of it maybe left a bit of a like a white residue, but it's not a material storage. It's not. It's 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 literally just the where the ice melts um, once a year from the uh, de-icing of the rink itself. Um, so that, are that's there any additional chemicals in the ice to keep it frozen more that leaches outward? I, Vito or Jason, are you? I see you. It's the other Adam Blank, maybe. So you know the answer. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, if you, Adam, I can answer. Adam. No, no, it's just water. Why would water leave a red stain, though? Because when they paint the lines, Steve, uh, for uh, some of the blue lines and red lines, some of that is in the ice. And when they shave that, that's a piece of that. And I asked specifically if there's any toxicity. He said, no, it's a latex non-toxic. So when you shave the ice, you're going to shave some of that, you know, some of the markings on the ice down. That's what that is. So that that was one um, issue that was raised. Um, another was that um, there was a concern that this the, there's four lights on the side of the building, um, and, and the side uh, called the northerly side. But when we look back at the survey, it's it's this wall that faces the main parking area um, is where those lights are located. Um, uh, there was concern about these lights not being shielded. Um, these, these lights were 
approved 15 years ago when the ice house came in to light the parking lot. There was a lighting plan submitted to planning and zoning and it was approved, it hasn't been changed. Um, so um, we we think they're, they're approved. They should they should be fine to, to stay. Um, but if, if there's going to be any requirement of any kind of a change, um, one, you know, we, there is a, a real need to make sure that the entrance and the parking area is well lit, both so that there's not injuries, but also to make sure that the clients feel comfortable and safe in the evening, because it is used in the evening, uh, coming in and out of the facility. Um, you know, it's kind of like a sparsely populated area uh, in the evening, uh, other than when 314 next door is, is cranking. Um, and so they do need real lighting uh, here. Um, and I would suggest that in your um, draft resolution to approve, um, if, if you're, that we just be clear that we're talking about the, the four lights on the side of the building uh, shown here, which is what my understanding is what staff's concern was, um, rather than trying to figure out if there's other lights in different areas that are gonna now become an issue. But but again, th these were all approved in a lighting plan um, by the zoning commission. Um, so that's the, the second issue. There was a, th a third issue raised, um, on uh, a rain garden, um, when it was originally approved, there were uh, there was a rain garden um, on the southern property line. In fact, there's a couple of rain gardens on the site. Uh, all of them are still there. The one on the southern property line over the years, um, there was some flooding that brought salt water in and killed off the vegetation. And at some point in time, that vegetation was replaced with gravel. Um, there's still the, the piping that runs in the um, in the rain garden to drain. Um, and there's still the oil and uh, water separator in there. So it still functions. It just has gravel rather than the plantings. Um, if if you want the plantings restored, that can be done for that um, for that rain garden. That's not not an issue. Um, and I think, so I think those were the only things, I mean, we wanna be able to continue to shave the ice. I think that's a necessary component for the for the rink to be able to shave the ice once a year. Um, uh, we're uh, okay with trying to work with staff and that's what we would prefer the, the, the condition of approval say to just work with staff on those four lights on the side of the building to, to come up with a solution that's safe for the for the consumers and also makes them feel safe because there's sometimes a difference between perception and reality but we want them to feel safe and be safe um and we 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 don't want to be an eyesore for our neighbors either but but we'd like to work with staff on that rather than have a a very uh a condition that somebody could say we're violating so we just we'll work with staff to to get the lighting fixed uh to the extent that it's a concern of yours and we can restore the the rain garden um and i think that that's all that I have is a presentation. Um, happy to answer questions or have uh, Kevin um, answer questions if you've got some. Attorney Blank, um, the um, other field uh, that uh, on Martin Luther King uh, Drive, um, when it was a turf field, had some very serious parking issues. Now, I know that you meet the requirements for parking. But the fact is, for facilities like this, um, our, our language um, is not what it ought to be. Um, we don't have um, um, language to um, cover places like this that can attract um, very significant numbers of um, uh, students. Um, have you looked at that issue at yeah. all? So, so Chairman, I, so I have sort of three comments. Number one, I, I agree completely that the regulation 
is like a one size fits all for recreation. Mm -hmm. and it, that's not really the, the right approach because I, 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 I'm not saying that, that your staff's done anything wrong or you guys have, it's just that different users and uses will generate substantially more or less parking needs that, that may not be tied to square footage. Um, and so I think it, I think it's hard to come up with a, a, a great solution for, for these types of facilities. Um, you know, if you do it based on square footage, um, you know, a tennis court might need, let's say, let's just say that if your tennis court needs four, your pickleball court with your indoor pickleball would need four as well, but you might have three, three pickleball courts for every one tennis court. So triple the, the traffic. If you have spectators and if you're going to have competitions, that makes a huge difference um, for your, your parking needs. Um, so I don't love the current reg and I can't recall, but I know I've looked at it. I, I, I think that the future reg, um, I had some issues with as well, um, or the proposed reg. Uh, I thought in some cases it was, it, it would require way too many spaces. Um, but for this specific site, this isn't the field house. And we, and these owners and the operators had nothing to do with that location ever. Um, but you can see, I put up the parking analysis here, but the, the, the gist of it is that under your regs, and if, even if you, uh, even if you think that your regs are, don't require enough parking, 217 spaces are required and 335 are being provided. So, you know, that's a lot of, of leeway here in the event that there's, um, you know, that, that the, the 15 spaces is not enough. There's still, you know, 120 more um, that, that we can play with. So I don't, I don't think parking is going to be an issue for this site. I, I do generally think that, you know, bowling and tennis and pickle and all, all of these, and you've gotten a bunch of these, all these different kinds of recreational facilities, they all have different parking needs. Um, and it's hard to come up with the regulation that suitably covers them all without punishing others that don't need much parking, but, but they're, they take up a ton of space. Um, Should uh, the 335 spaces be inadequate? Um, is there an opportunity anywhere on the property uh, to um, put additional um, spaces in? I'll I'll let Kevin speak to that. And I think Kevin, we can also mention that the 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 turf um, their peak time period of use doesn't doesn't match up with the hockey as much i have a couple of comments and, and and i think it's a good question about um about the parking <clears throat> and um i remember when mike Rin was talking to me when we were getting the parking calculations for the hockey rink and he said yeah we we have a problem up the street with the field house because we didn't do the parking correctly uh and that's correct the big and major difference in, and this is extremely important, they were having competition up there and games. And so they had parents coming in to watch the games. Our facility here is only practice. So it's completely different. There'll be drop-offs actually in front of the hockey rink, which is designed for drop-offs. There's an extra lane where you pull in, uh, where they have in and out traffic, you pull into a third lane, you drop off, the players will walk through the hockey rink, which is a center aisle right through the middle, and then there'll be a doorway and walk into the extra facility. But it's only practice. The field house, they didn't create any parking to accommodate for the fact that they had lacrosse games where my son played, soccer games where they played, uh, 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 volleyball where they played. So there's the major difference. Um, and you didn't even have any parking there. You basically had a parking area when you came in and nothing else. Uh, I think there maybe was, I don't even know, was it 40 or 50 parking spaces? But again, I, I want to reiterate and repeat myself. They had competition there. So all the kids come, all the parents come, all the spectators come. That's not what we're doing. We're doing practice fields. So kids get dropped off, parents leave, kids finish, they walk back out to the front, they get picked up out front. That, that's number one. Um, but to your point anyway, is there additional parking? 
The other thing about Wilson Avenue that does not does not exist on Martin Luther King is on both sides of 136. There is a huge long parking lane on both the uh, east side and the west side. And if anybody's driven down there during the day, you will notice the cars that are sometimes there. Weekends, they're not. Evenings, they're not. So even though that's not, couldn't be counted from a zoning standpoint, from a practical standpoint, there's a whole bunch of additional street parking, which I don't think we'll ever need, uh, uh, but it does exist there. Again, um, practice fields are completely different than um, uh, sports facilities with competition against uh, a team competition. Excuse me, <clears throat> don't a lot of the students drive their own cars to practices? You know, you get a driver's license at 16, so th they practice at 17, 18? Well, we have a lot of kids that are younger than that they are going to be practicing there. And when you come in and most of the hockey kids, most of it is parents dropping most of these kids off. Will there be some? There will be some. Um, but most of these are youth programs that are in um, junior high, summer high school. Uh, and the experience that, that, that and, I, and I want to step back one. I'm not the operator of the facility. I'm the owner of the, of the, of the property. So I don't run the facility. So, but I'm, unless J Jason speaks up, um, I have met with my tenants multiple times about, you know, what the use is going to be, how many students are going to be dropped off versus, you know, parents picking them up. Uh, so the, the big thing that really drives traffic is when it's competition. That's the big number because the kids are coming, the parents are coming, you know, other people come to watch the games. You know, that's when you have a Brian McMahon football game, right? All the cars come into the parking lot. When you just drop kids off for practice and they practice, the number of cars are very low. Uh, uh, Kevin, uh, Jason Gromowski, I'm going to be the operator there. I can tell you from the standpoint of the organizations that we're looking at, it's going to be youth lacrosse, youth soccer. And I can tell you that we're talking 16 and under. Uh, this is more of a development injury prevention based turf. Um, the, the whole idea that this whole came together is because the outreach people complaining to me, I'm a physical therapist. I do injury prevention. I deal a lot with the youth in, in the area in Fairfield County. Um, the amount of injuries that were occurring on all these other different turf site uh, uh, services was, was affecting me. And I said, I need to do something. So I reached out to the organizations. They said, this is the only place that we can practice and have turf facilities. I said, I won't even let my own daughter practice on those turfs because of the rate, the rate of injuries that were occurring. Um, so I was looking out and when Sono shut down, I, everybody, we had to go practice at, um, not, I don't wanna use the facility's name, but we had to go to another facility, which was completely unsafe. I had just seen three ACLs prior in the month. Um, I decided to see what I could do. And that's when I reached out to Kevin and talked to Kevin about everything. And I said, this would be a great idea since I'm already working with the youth at Sono. Um, the, the traffic pattern, I've been to Sono Fieldhouse, I can't, uh, probably 50 to 100 times. It has a single lane that goes in, circles around, parents sit there, they always want to watch their kids. This will be a zero observational uh, program. The, the parents won't even be able to get in the facility and stand anywhere because it won't be allowed um, to even view the turf aspect. So the parents will have to drop them off, they'll come in, and they'll feed back around. And if, if anyone's been to the ice house, there's actually two lanes of traffic that go and it's all the way around. And there's two entrances, two exits. It's a very ease of use. Right, thanks Jason. And, 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 you know, just from a practical stand, from a, from a, actually from a zoning standpoint, as you see, we have almost a hundred more parking spaces or 125, whatever the calculation was, more than we're currently required to have. Mike here, I got a comment. Sure. I'm gonna support staff because uh, it was a good um, comment about the lights. The All the parking lot lights are fully uh, dark sky compliant and full, fully cut off. The, you know, the, uh, they're very up to date fixtures on all the uh, light posts in the parking lot, but the wall packs, those are, that's what those are called. Those four fixtures are called wall packs. 
those are obsolete technology. We we used, I'm surprised that this, this got approved originally and that's was a mistake, but I think probably starting 10 years ago, we always asked for full cutoff. So I think this might've been approved right before then. But, um, and I'm gonna just take this as a teaching moment for lighting. All the light energy coming out of those lights, the majority of it is not going on the ground where you want it. It's going horizontally out to people's eyes where it causes temporary blindness. It's a split second, but it's a blind spot that in a parking lot could be deadly because you can't see because the lights are so glary. If you put shields on those lights, and there used to be a sheet metal company called Casey Sheet Metal in Norwalk that used to do it. They used to go around because I used to go around and pay them to do it in our neighborhood on lights, that wall packs that were like on Ben Franklin School that were shining up in our bedroom windows at night and they put shields on them, what that does is it reflects more light down onto the ground, makes the light, makes the ground brighter and it's safer because you cut, you're, you're directing the light energy down onto the ground and you have light in the parking lot. So I think that if you put shields on those four lights, which should not cost that much money if you have a good sheet metal person who can fabricate a shield very easily, uh, screw it onto the side of the building and have the light go down, you will be getting the light out of Village Creek uh, homeowners' eyes. You will be getting the light out of the parking lot eyes. It would be a win-win for everybody. And I think you would find that in the long run, it's actually safer and it makes the building and the parking lot more attractive <laughs> because you don't have these glary prison-like lights shining in your eyes. So I'm gonna, I'm, that's a condition that I think we need to keep in. And I really wanna thank Steph for catching that because especially bright lights near, you know, we're working so hard around the city, changing all the street lights in South Norwalk, for instance, um, to full cutoff, uh, Washington Street, you can see it. People wrote letters immediately thanking us for, no, for removing the glare into their windows uh, that they had to suffer with for ever since those lights were installed, you know, 40 years ago. So all of South Norwalk is now have, has, uh, indirect, down by Soundview Landing, all the lights have been changed. The lights are no longer shining horizontally into people's eyes, causing glare and causing temporary blindness, which could cause uh, you to not see a pedestrian in a crosswalk or someone walking through the parking lot. So uh, definitely shield the lights. I would uh, recommend that. Uh, Mike, I think it's an excellent idea. I, I, I know that all the rest of the lights, even though we did this 15 years ago, are dark sky lights. They're all design that for whatever reason these were approved I, I, I don't really remember um my only concern is for safety quite honestly that area off the building is fairly wide before you get to the first set of lights that come down in the in the um in the uh, uh in the parking lot and right. that's why they did it because you've got a walkway and then three lanes of traffic and then you come to the parking lot uh, where the first set of lights are. So there's a pretty big distance. So I'm assuming that's why they put them up to kind of span that distance because there are no poles. You know, they can't have the poles in a three lane parking. There's no place to put them. So we don't have a problem putting them on. We only want to make sure uh, that, yeah, I think there's no, that, that, that cars are safe. And because all, when hockey's full, we'll have like 125 or 150 cars in there and so there's a lot of parents and kids that walk from the parking area across that even though it's a walkway we just want to make sure it's lighted so specifically people don't get hurt so it's safe so whatever that takes we're 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 on board with i understand and that that's why you wouldn't have a vertical shield you'd have a 45 degree angle shield just no. throwing a, an angle out there that no. would allow the light to go out into the into the driveway not just go straight down but it would cut it would cut 50% of the light going out horizontally. So a 45 degree shield would no. still get the light and you would get more, and it would be brighter. Of course, safety uh, is the main issue. The problem with the lighting plans that uh, the photometric plans is they don't show glare, you know, and so when we approve them, they only show the light on the ground in foot candles, but they don't give a, it's not a glare diagram. It's always been a, a shortcoming of, the photometric plans that are done by engineers. Yep. Uh, so uh, in this case, I think you could accomplish the, the uh, keep it safe 
and you'll find a big improvement uh, if you do it. I'd be happy to go offline and help you Thank with you. more suggestions, but I'm going to put that in as a condition, uh, or I'm going to suggest it, and the commission can decide whether they want to keep it or not. Understood. Other that, questions? Okay, Attorney Blank, anything else before we open it to the public? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Um, Steve or Brian, uh, you want to explain uh, how people can uh, comment on this? Again, Certainly. I'm going to suggest that uh, give us, uh, provide, just provide your name and your address, please, when you speak. Sure. If you want to speak to this item, uh, you can use the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen, or if you're dialing by phone, hit star nine and that will raise your hand for you. I'm going to guess, Mr. Chairman, there's more people interested in the next item on the agenda than, I, I, than the turf field. No offense to the turf field, but I think. <laughs> no one, Steve? No. Okay. If not, uh, then um, we'll turn it back uh, to Attorney Blank. Uh, nothing further. We appreciate your time. Okay. Uh, any of the uh, commission members have uh, further comments? The only thing I would add. Oh, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. sorry, Chapin. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not seated, so I didn't know if I was allowed to advocate for anything that uh, will be voted absolutely. on. Absolutely, you, okay. you, you can. Uh, yeah, so um, in the uh, staff uh, pointed out um, the storage of the uh, shaved ice, as, as we've uh, discussed tonight, um, the paint that's in there um, sounds like it's latex based and probably not something we want to go into our waterways. So I wanted to call out to those who are evaluating this later to keep that in as a condition to evaluate uh, proper storage of those materials. Thank you. Uh, anything else? All right, uh, if not, uh, can we put up the um, proposed resolution? Let me know when you want me to scroll. I think scroll. you can start scrolling. Uh, number six can say just uh, the four wall packs, the four light fixtures on the north facade. That's what staff called out, so I assume those are the offending lights. Because the rest of them are shielded, Kevin's right. The, the rest of the lights are actually really pretty good. They're very good. They're uh, All of the light poles are flat, fully shielded uh, lights. on North Facade. Hard to be, yeah. And I think seven and eight, sort of what Chapin was talking about. On seven, if it's ice, it may take longer than 10 days to melt. But I, I want to address the issue on that, that paint. I'll make, you, I, I will. I'm, I'm uh, sorry at this, at this oh, point, uh, Mr. Conroy, you can't speak. My, my apologies. My apologies. That's all right. But we do have a solar panel on the building. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um. I don't have any problem with seven. We're we're talking about within 10 days of this approval. So that should not be an issue. I think Mr. 
Conroy may have uh, misunderstood and thought it was within 10 days of it being placed there. Um, well, I think one thing, I mean, the way I read eight is potentially that ICE can't go there anymore, barring further understanding of what's actually in it. That's how I read eight, not, um, Lou, is that how you read eight as well? That's how I read eight. I was okay. referring to seven, but you're okay. absolutely right. Yes. Do you, do you want to qualify eight a little bit pending further analysis of the material? I leave that, yeah, I leave that to you, Steve, on if you think it needs to be further um, clarified. I would say the word storage is misleading. He's not storing it. It's just ice that's being put outside to melt. Well, the concern is that it's not just ice, right? That there's ice other chemicals yeah. embedded within it. Right. I think the storage also, if you're worried about parking, that if they're taking up parking spaces with right. stuff, I mean, not saying they are, but just kind of covers that in general. Sure. Okay. Um, are we ready to act on this? I'm not seeing anyone yes. saying no. Uh, Steve, let's do a roll call. Did we have a motion? I'm sorry. Somebody, I write to, nobody made a motion. Um, I'll uh, motion to approve them. Okay, thank you, Nick. Second. That's, that's uh, you're moving on the motion, the, on the resolution as amended. On the, on the resolution sorry. as altered. And Tammy seconded. Okay. I, I think this is a great idea and I'm gonna definitely approve it uh, and good luck. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, and I again, I'm sorry, I was- Mr. Pachas was seeing. Thank you. Mr. Pachas. Okay. Unless we lost Mr. Pachas. No, he's still there. No, he's here, yes. He said yes. He said, okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Wells? Yes. Ms. Langallis? Yes. Ms. Jordan Byron? Yes. Mr. Cantor? Yes. Mr. Rowena? Yes. Mr. Mushak? Yes. And Mr. Shulman? Yes. Also unanimous. Okay. Uh, am I voting? Okay, I'm on sorry, Mr. Williams. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, it's 9 11. Let's uh, reconvene at uh, 9 21. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I'm all right. Um, I appreciate the uh, patience of uh, the people uh, waiting online for this last item, the uh, draft zoning regulations and zoning map discussion. But um, as you saw, uh, we had a fairly substantial uh, amount of business uh, that had to be conducted. Um, we do uh, have two public hearings coming up on 21st of this month, the 28th of this month. Um, we don't yet have time or location uh, because uh, they're going to need to be hybrid meetings and the city has had some difficulty um, uh, establishing uh, hybrid meetings in uh, some of the larger venues in City Hall. Uh, that still has to be worked out. Um, but this is 2023-19 RM Planning and Zoning Commission Zoning Text Amendment for Complete Rewrite of the Zoning Regulations and Map Amendment uh, for Complete Rezoning of the Entire City. This is a continuing uh, review and uh, staff updates. And uh, with that, uh, I'll um, turn it over to uh, Steve Kleppen. You did, Steve. Hmm. Okay, Steve, it's in your court. So I put together some slides to show the changes because you know uh, they're 
you know, and not unexpected, there's been some concern uh, about some of the upzoning, excuse me, upzoning proposals. And, uh, you know, the mayor's made some comments. He, he's expressed concern that the changes have gone too far. So, you know, we've been, you know, thinking about that. And, and, and from the staff's position, it's, you know, for us, it was always a draft map and it was like the basis of discussion you know, to get things moving. So, you know, it, it was nothing that we didn't expect that was were going to be changes down the road. Um, and, you know, I anticipate there'll probably be further changes to the map as the public process continues to evolve. As, as the chairman mentioned, we have two hearings scheduled, one on the 21st and one on the 28th. So we, you know, in, in anticipation of that um, and hopefully which will, you know, take care of some of the concerns we've had. We have pulled back, I think, pretty significantly some of the proposed upzoning, particularly around the one to the two family. So I'm going to show you those areas, areas in detail um, and then, you know, happy to take any questions or comments you have about those changes, pending what your, uh, you know, what, what your thinking is on what we've proposed. Then what we'll do is publish the revised draft map get that up on the website, you know, by, I would say we may not get it tomorrow, but certainly by Friday, we can get that accomplished. So that way people have a, you know, a couple of weeks before the, the public hearing to see if the changes, for, you know, in their particular situation are, are more palatable or not. Um, kind of starting, I guess, north to south, and I kind of had to come up with some names for some of these because they're not necessarily neighborhoods per se, but there's, you know, just a series of streets. Um, so as part of the, you know, our, our initial thinking, you know, we, we tried to think about it analytically where, and I've, I've been kind of speaking about this at nauseum at different uh, venues, where we try to focus development around uh, significant transit facilities, where our infrastructure is and our, you know, major employers are. So up at Merit 7 area, as you recall, we rezoned the west side of Glover Avenue to accommodate additional growth um, in support of the existing office towers. Um, but there's not a lot of activity on the east side of Main Ave in that area. So right on the other side of that, we had thought, you know, OK, it's within a quarter mile. It's very close. We'll take this area, which we're calling kind of the creeping hemlock area and propose it to allow two family zoning as well as the single. But the real issue there is, and, and you know, it's really from a common sense point of view, is that the topography of that area doesn't really lend itself to walkability in many regards, just based on the fact that it's a pretty significant slope from Main Ave to these properties. So they don't have direct access to Main Ave. You'd have to really go way down towards um, the merit to get there. So we're going to recommend um, that the areas in this area, which is kind of highlighted, uh, it's yellow, and the areas with the proposed change, I should highlight to make it a little easier for folks to understand, this kind of dark red bold outline, that was the area that was initially proposed to go into the two family, um, ex existing right now as a B zone single family. So we're proposing to put it back into sing single family, which is this CD, 3S uh, designation. Does that uh, did that make sense, or was that a little bit too jumbled? No, that seems clear to me. So the colors we see here are the proposed colors. So you're proposing it be this light yellow. On the draft map we have, it was some other color. Correct. Yeah, that's why okay. we put the bold, the, the red. It Thank was you, the red outline just to show where the area of change is. So moving further south, um, this is the area near Norwalk Hospital. Um, the hospital is on the kind of bottom right of your screen, which is to the southeast. Um, the, the thinking is that, you know, hospital is obviously, uh, you know, one of the major, if not the most significant employer in the city. So it makes sense to allow more density in and around the hospital. So <laughs> hospital staff uh, doesn't necessarily have to be uh, in have to take uh, motorized transport to get to the hospital. So there is a lot of multifamily and two family in that area now, but we did expand it out quite a bit. So similar to what we just talked about, this area, which is Northwest of the hospital, 
was proposed initially to go into two family, uh, but we're going to recommend that it revert back to the single family. And what this does, and at the end, I can show you kind of the, the broader zoning map is we, 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 we stick stuck to, I would say with the revisions a little more to our basics of what we talked about in terms of, you know, around the, those employment centers, around the infrastructure and around the transit hubs that within that quarter mile walk shed, we have more density than a quarter mile beyond that, which is really you know, when you get out to about a half mile radius, that's probably the extent of what people are, you know, comfortable walking or probably will walk. So when you get beyond that half mile, it's a little bit of a stretch to, to expect or think people will actually walk to some of these um, major areas. So this area was probably a little broader than it should have been initially. So we pulled that area back and are recommending it that retain its um, single family designation. And that, it's a pretty large area overall, probably the, one of the larger ones that were retracted. Any questions? Yeah, so what was the dist so the, the quarter mile, half mile, are you saying that that wasn't actually followed with this area and this area this, was 0.75 miles? What what was yeah. it? it? It went a little beyond the, the half mile radius because there was some overlap to the north because there's some uh, New Canaan Ave is up here. So that got pulled in. So that was car part of the rationale to include it in the two family initially. Um, and then part of the other thinking was when we started uh, you know, putting the lines together was, you know, you, you know, trying to keep things a little more cohesive. And then if you look off to the west here, which to the or to the left, then you're starting to get into this large area of civic property. So it's like you'll end up with this small band of single family zoning where everything else would have been two family. So we that part of that got wrapped in. But at the end of the day, it was a little probably a little more ambitious than what was necessary for the initial cut. Well, I, I'm confused. I thought that you, I mean, you have this great employment center, which is the hospital that's attracting people. And so why are you, why, why wouldn't that be proposed to expand housing? So we did, we, we did quite a bit. Um, this, this purple area that's around here, that's all, um, proposed to go into what's CD4, which is a multifamily zone. There is some multifamily allowed around there now, as well as two family, but we broadened out the, the multifamily in and around the hospital. So there is more opportunity in that area than there was previously. What's that area of CV in the middle? What is that? Uh, what that Kendall is? Elementary. That's Kendall. Okay, that, now I'm oriented where we are. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Darren. Thanks, yeah. And then to the uh, far left was Oak Hills. Yeah, yes. that's the golf course, yes. right. Okay. So are you splitting this area where you have like one part zone for one, one family and the other part for two? Cause it's all kind of like in the same neighborhood. Yeah. That's yes, but they look very different. <laughs> There, there is a dividing line, which is, you know, across through here, um, you know, we were asked to take a look to which when we'll further evaluate somebody had asked, you know, to try not to split streets with the zoning, even though that's pretty uh, prevalent right now throughout the city. So we're going to take another look at that to see if it makes sense to look at like where perhaps like where rear yards for different zones bet up as opposed to splitting the street. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll continue to take a peek at that particular aspect of it. Yeah, I noticed that in a couple of places. I think that's a good idea, splitting the yeah, back. Yeah, I, I think it makes down sense. Down the back rather than down the middle of the road. Yeah, we, I mean, it's easier from one, from just, I think, from the mapping standpoint to, to follow the street lines, but I it might not make the most sense for the neighborhood to do that. So we'll we'll continue to evaluate that aspect of it. Hmm. Okay. So moving- Could you reissue, uh, sorry, after this is over, can you guys reissue that change in density map to show it with this proposal so we can compare that before and after? Like I'm, I'm looking at the change in density and I'm looking at this and I'm trying to match up streets. That would be helpful as well. Yeah, we can do that. We'll, we'll have, uh, you know, whatever format you think is most helpful, we're, we're happy to accommodate that. Um, 
So this is what uh, near Cedar Street, further south. Um, you know, we're down by towards ninety five. Um, the in this area was trying to apply the same kind of logic that we had applied previously, where you're within um, you know quarter mile of Route One, so it makes sense to have additional density in and around that that major area. Um, so what we did was initially was proposed to go into CD4 because right now this CD4C area is existing um, business one and business number two zone. So th there's no real change in, in what's permitted in those areas now, but it immediately there was no um, buffer applied and no ability to have additional, um, additional housing in and around that area, which might make it easier for somebody if they worked in these areas to, you know, potentially walk to work or, uh, you know, have provide other means of transportation. But, you know, I think that was at the end of the day was probably a little too aggressive. So the, the recommendation has been revised to put it into the two family zone for the multifamily. I think the buffer lines up um, a little more smoothly. This is the area, there were two parts. There was around Jew half, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. It was B to CD4. And then just north of that, it was A to CD4. Does that right, change yeah. encompass both? So both of those areas uh, go to CD3, which is like zone C. That Correct. both of those. So for one of them, it's like a two step down zone <laughs> from what was proposed. And for the other, it's one step down zone. Yeah, they were both um, mm -hmm. single family, so it's A and the B, so it's just, a, you know, the only difference was the lot size between the two. Thank you. Um, last night, I had a meeting with uh, the Golden Hill folks. Um, right now, the current zoning for the Golden Hill area is um, C residence, which is uh, one or two family. There are multifamily zones, um, excuse me, well, multifamily properties within this area. Um, the recommendation, and, and, and I think they made some compelling arguments in terms of the, the kind of the historic feel for the area and the work was done previously in terms of some of the land use changes that they put forward, such as the um, village district. Um, so the recommendation would be to not change that to the CD4, which is the multifamily and leave it as the one and two family zone. Um, so that is kind of Golden Hill. Just to the west of Golden Hill. Um, so this area through here uh, was proposed to upzone to the uh, to to the CD three, which is the one or two family from single family zoning. Most of it was uh, B zoning proposed. So we've pulled back quite a bit of that. So you can see this is a pretty significant amount of parcels that got pulled back. And, and, and part of the rationale too is it's there's not a lot of great connection points to Route 1 through these areas. Um, so we recommended pulling those back. And we did, did keep these areas uh, up to the northeast of that section into the CD3 zone because there is better um, pedestrian connectivity to some areas up through, uh, up through those neighborhoods. Quick question for you, Steve. Um, is there a reason that sliver of uh, Taylor is uh, still CD4 between uh, Golden Hill and the area that we're looking at? Sure, that that's the that that matches up to existing zoning today. Right now, that's um, D residence, which is a multifamily zone. Which was, to be honest with you, that was part of the rationale for putting um, Golden Hill in multifamily initially, because it's really kind of surrounded by multifamily in a lot of sides. So I, I think if in that area, you can, you can make arguments either way. I think they would be logical ones either way. Um, but yeah, that, that was the recommendation we ended up with. So Steve, can you pull it out a little bit so that we could see the other side of like a budding Golden Hill and Fairfield Avenue? Or do you not have that on that? Screen. I don't have it on. I can do that afterwards. I can pull up okay. the, the overall zoning map. Um, the problem with so, the, with the slides, I can't. They're static, so I can't switch them out. Sure. Oh, know. okay. So, so Taylor Avenue, with the exception of being right on Taylor Avenue, where there are some businesses south of ninety five, went from being purple, multi, any, not two family, not three family, but apartments 
to back to being two family, just one to two family, not three plus. Are you talking in, in this area through here? No, not just the Golden Hill, but the to the west of it, right? What's now CD3. Yeah, so this is proposed. So CD3 is the one or two. Um, right. Presently, I think most of that is B, B zone, which is single, um, except for this, what we were just talking about, this kind right, of the purple, business area. Purple, purple slot that runs down through there, which is existing multifamily. Okay, so CD3 means one to two family, right? Okay, thank you. Sure. Right, that is already existing one to three, one to two family, right? Right. And so what's the change if it's already existing? No, so th this area right now is is uh, B zone, which is single. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it recommended to initially this whole area, if you can follow my where I'm going, mm -hmm. this whole area is proposed to go from single to one and two. So we've scaled it back to this area through here. And, and JJ, those Avenue A, B, and Z, those were all actually proposed to go to CD4 originally. So that's the multi, and now it's down to the two. Right, which was purple on the original map, if that helps, because it's easy to talk about the colors rather than these numbers and letters that we're still getting used it, to. It, it would be great if you could like insert some reference points or some neighborhood markers, because it is just alphabet city here. <laughs> no pun intended, that is... <laughs> <laughs> ABC. No, I think right, if exactly you got, no. alphabet if you got, city in alphabet city, yeah. <laughs> right. If you got the old map or the original map, if you received it from P and Z, there was it was online or you could pick up a big one. Yeah. And now you can kind of you can compare. And it's easier if you just look at it by color rather mm -hmm. than all these letters and numbers because they're yeah. thank you. Offered. Thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. Yeah, and we'll, um, you know, after our, you know, we chat this through tonight, we'll we'll print out um, large maps again and, and you provide those to the commission as well. So yeah, maybe you have like, you know, version one, version two, and then whatever it ends up being version three, if anything else gets changed. Right. That would be great. And that strip that's sort of left um, purple, kind of the way you didn't, the things that you didn't like about the current map sort of left that way. If that were to be changed to CD3 to make it consistent, then you'd have a bunch of non-conforming properties. Is that the problem? Yeah, I think then you're kind of punishing those folks in reverse. So I think mm -hmm. that's why we would not recommend going that direction. And again, I think from my- When you say big, punishing. Big, well, I've been because, hearing a lot of language about winners and losers and punishing, and, and I just want to well, make sure that I understand what we're talking about, not just like. So that would be a down zone for them, because then you're right. taking away, you know, if somebody say they have a four family on that property and the max they could do today with new zoning is two. So then they kind of you, you kind of freeze them in place over time. Um, but if you take somebody from going to allowing a two family to a four family, you're actually incentivizing them, you know, giving them additional bonus or benefit onto their property. Yeah. So I think there's I think there's plenty of people who would say that having two and then being allowed to do four is the punishment. And other people that would say having four and then or having three and then <clears> suddenly <throat> you can't expand to four anymore is a punishment. So I I just it would be helpful with each one to like really define why that change, like what that change would look like. Um, I don't want to assume that that we're all thinking the same thing in terms of what's a benefit and what's not a benefit. There's not really consensus there, I think. Um, and this was kind of one area that was kind of from the beginning, I think was the first area that really kind of spoke out loudly was the Devil's Garden area. Um, so we've remove that entire area. This was previously proposed as um, B residents. We pulled it all out, um, reverted it back to single family. So I, that one I think is makes sense. And there's a, you know, a pretty good dividing line um, with the road network that exists there as well.
another area that also was pretty vocal, um, still pretty vocal, Shorefront Park, um, which is existing uh, B residence zone now. Uh, we have proposed to two family given its proximity um, and being surrounded by um, being surrounded by the two family on, on you know all sides and then uh, more intense multifamily kind of to the north and the northwest of that area. But um, th there are you know some arguments to be made based on the historical character of that and, and you know there are some private uh, community restrictions that go in place with a lot of these properties that give it a little more kind of unique character. So I think our recommendation will be to leave it as is with the uh, single family zone. So we go into the CD3S. Um, very similar uh, seaside place, which is in East Norwalk. Um, and again, I'm sorry, this, I'm thinking about this too, it'd probably be easier to look at it from a blown up perspective, but, and I'll show you these when we get to the bigger map, but this area today is all single family. Um, to the north is a one and two family zone, the C zone, and then basically everything to the southeast is single family. So, we, you know, our recommendation is to leave that area as single family and, you know, remove it from the one to two family zone. Steve, as you're talking through these, do you see how CD3 is one to two family, CD3S is one family? Why not just make it CD1 or two and get rid of the three? It's so cumbersome. It's, it's because the, the it's a, since it's a form-based um, transect, CD1 and CD2 are kind of, extremely rural so that would be like if you're on a ranch in montana that would be cd1 yeah. no i and mean I, CD... I, i'm sorry i understand that but you should put the keep the letters together and, and make it logical for people it's like it's it's illogical to me the way these zones <clears throat> break out and you've got this three s and three you know just the three and the three has more houses in it than the one with S that has single. Like it just, it doesn't make sense to me at all. I think it's very awkward. And I think the public, when they're going to use it, yeah, you guys are going to get used to it, but the public isn't going to get it. Okay, we can keep looking at it. Sure. Thank you. <sighs> um, further northeast from that area near Strawberry Hill, which kind of runs right through here. This is the Norton property here. This area. Uh, currently zone B resident zone, we had proposed to wrap it into the CD3, which is again, the one and two family zone, since there is a lot of two family in the neighborhood, we've proposed to, um, or recommending that this area get removed from, removed from that area and revert back to the uh, single family zone. Why? Like, that's what I don't understand is, is, I understand things like the one that's um, up north, that like a closer look at the topography means that like, actually it's not really walkable to where the businesses are and where the transit are. Like that, that makes sense. But like, are there sort of rational regions or is it just about like who complained the most? No, because as I don't know who specifically complained in this area um, per se. I think when we, you know when we kind of take and I, I could probably illustrate it better on the, you know the larger map, I'll, which I'll pull up um, once we get there. I think it's only a few more of these slides to go through. But I think we, if if we're trying to be consistent with what we are recommending in terms of you know if in this general area you're you know a quarter mile from this vantage point or a half mile from this vantage point based on you know the infrastructure employment center or you know transit hub i think that lines up a little better i mean from if if we were playing purely uh you know an exercise game we would fix a lot of these anomalies within the regulations maybe is what you're getting at when you have two family on one side and two family on another side so why do you have single family in the middle so it doesn't really make sense from that exactly. perspective but i think it's and, and in some cases it's a little less disruptive and a little more um and, and honestly a little more palatable for folks and, and again from my 
perspective, if we can get the zones correct, um, where the lines ultimately end up to me is less of an issue. And then those lines can be moved over time based on the needs of the community. So if the communities, uh, there's a desire to keep, you know, live in Norwalk and we're having trouble um, accommodating the housing types we need, then you, you adjust the lines accordingly based on the needs of the community. So, so Steve, I remember um, at some of the other meetings where we talked about expanding, well, the possibility of expanding housing by allowing people to have the ADUs in their backyards or to have, um, you know, duplex housing. And so is that now off the table in these neighborhoods that have um, reverted back to the original zones? No, so so the for, so for this area is a you know good way to answer that is it, the, if if it does remain a single family zone, you can still do an ADU or a, a detached ADU is the same as the regulations you guys passed um, earlier this year. It just couldn't do the two family in this area. It doesn't mean that the where the other areas there are a lot of other areas still proposed to go from single to two family, so that's not taken off the books completely, um, but it was scaled back quite a bit. And um, for the, you know, kind of the areas that we just went through, and I think there's one more, and then there's the, the waterfront areas, if, if I can just wrap this up. So the last, I think this is the last area of the- um, the chicken and broccoli is done. Help yourself. I'm sorry? Someone's dinner's ready. Did, dinner is oh. ready. Sorry, that sounds Yachty. delicious. My husband's it, dinner. It certainly ready. does. All right. It's chicken and broccoli. <laughs> sounds very healthy, too. Yeah, but it's um, got good stuff and it. It's marinated. <laughs> so the last area, which is a little bit east of um, City Hall, um, we initially, so this, this is another one of those quirky areas because to the north um, along Tierney Street, there's an existing um, Two family zoning now, so it's there. So it was another one, you know. And in many ways, it kind of you could make the argument that it should get wrapped in from just you know land use perspective, but then trying to be consistent with the the metrics that we applied. The 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 next recommendation is to take this area within the red highlight and then revert that back to single um, from two family. And the last two I want to talk about were. Um, Changes to the, the Norwalk Harbor that are being recommended, as you recall, on the uh, you know last version of the zoning map, there were several areas labeled um, to be determined. Uh, and that was because they, we were having uh, ongoing conversations with the Economic and Community Development Committee of Council, who had expressed concerns about the zoning designations about some of these parcels and ultimately what they would end up being. Um, so just to orientate everybody, uh, obviously here's Commerce Street, here's Wall Street. This is King Industry up through here, transitioning up to the Divine Brothers where they have the cement plant. On the other side of the river is the ONG, which is the formal asphalt plant, as well as the um, Descala development at head of the harbor north or south, sorry, south. Um, so the there was a, a zone within the, you know, the existing draft regulations that was called CD5W. That was really um, a carryover from the old, old existing zoning regulations, the CBDW zone. So that was what this area was designated as. We haven't proposed to change that at all. Um, Brian and I were actually thinking, at, since that was the only area that was zoned CBD5W, which is like these three or four parcels over here, that it might make sense to eliminate that as a zone since it was very unique. But based on um, concerns that were expressed by council for the way they like to see the waterfront hopefully develop over time, was we decided to remove this area from uh, other considerations such as industrial number two or more intensive housing like the CD5, and then um, put it into that CB, excuse me, the um, CD5W as well. Oops, sorry about that. So that CBD5W allows, it allows a mix of uses and we're recommending that since it is a waterfront use that waterfront uses also be allowed within that. So somebody may want to do like a boat building 
uh, property uh, operation there. These properties have a lot of challenges with them because of the topography. They're well below street grade in many areas. Uh, they railroad track cuts through some of these properties. So even though some of these properties look wider um, than they are, just because they're the railroad right of way is actually a little bit bigger than what's shown on the, the aerial pictures that you might look at. So we're, we, we, we think the CBD5W, which um, is proposed currently at six stories, but we're recommending that it drops down to perhaps four and a half stories because you don't want to completely obliterate water views. And that four and a half stories would be consistent with what um, the head of the Harbor South development ended up being. And I think it's in its lower height than what's allowed inland at that CD5. So I think that's something that makes sense. Um, further south, though, we are recommending that the King Industry properties, which is down through here, really is a heavy industrial use. Um, and it also makes sense to try to maintain uh, water dependent uses in this area based on the need to keep this uh, as a navigable channel, which leads to concerns about future dredging in the area. So I think that this mix through here um, seems to make more sense. The other area that was TBD in this screenshot was this parcel right here, which um, you can't really tell what it is from the zoning map designation, but that's that large medical office complex that has that really horrible, massive parking lot that butts right up to the river. But it really makes sense to keep that in the East Avenue Village District. It's just any other zoning designation doesn't quite, um, doesn't quite make sense for that area. And the last area we'll talk about is Water Street. Um, so right now mm -hmm. here is uh, Water Street itself. Right now, this entire area is zoned Marine Commercial, um, Economic, Community Development, Economic and Community Development Committee has um, expressed a desire for the northern half of that, for the properties that are closer to Washington Street, to be reconsidered from Marine Commercial to that CD5W as well, which will allow a little bit better mix of uses and hopefully lead to more of something more compatible what's going on with Washington Street. Similar to the property on the east side of, uh, or should say to the north of the Straffolina Bridge, west of Liberty Square. That's a property that's being, was taken by the state as part of the Walk Bridge program. We'd like to see that revert back to a more uh, public friendly use over time. Uh, and I think that that makes sense. If you look at in the, the draft zoning regulations, at the first page of the CBD 5W, or excuse me, the CD 5W um, section, they actually have a little schematic of a, like a future land use of what it could look like there. So we, we, we're in agreement with the changes proposed for that. Um, and then the lower part of uh, Water Street would remain uh, marine commercial. That's where the, you know, the predominant area of the, the heavy boat yards and boat traffic is. Um, I'm happy to zoom back out to the big map to look at these in a broader scale if that's something you think would help. Yeah. All right. My meta question, Steve, is there's a lot of talk <clears throat> about the missing middle. And I think a lot of the plan sort of tried to rectify that, um, put it out there, People got a little scared by what that actually means. And I just want to know, do you think we're still preserving or creating that missing middle in it, um, while, when you start to take back some of these spots? Yes, I think so. I, I, and because the um, there are still areas proposed, and look, I, again, I, I, I'm going to probably, if I'm not a betting guy, but if I was betting, I bet there'll be further changes to the map um, based on testimony that you're going to hear, you know, at, at your next couple of meetings for the evaluation over the summer, and then what we you ultimately decide to do. Totally. Um, but I, I think, you know, it, it definitely moves it in the right direction. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think the mayor made some good points too about, you know, we, you know, maybe it, it makes sense to scale it in a little more as opposed to just full implementation of what we had initially proposed and then dialing it back a little bit. And then, you know, we can evaluate it over time. This, this plan itself, um, you know, we'll do another POCD in about five years or so. So, you know, see what changes are recommended and come out of that plan as well. And that could further 
lead to a reevaluation of what's proposed uh, under this uh, scheme as well. So I can kind of go, how is that for scaling? Is that, you know, can you tell where we are? Need me to blow it up some more? Hearing nothing. Um, so this again, we kind of started in the same place. This is the um, Merit 7 area through here. This is where the office towers are. This is the west side of Glover, which was rezoned in um, just about a, maybe a year and a half ago. This was that uh, first area we talked about that was initially proposed. And this is again, that red outline is where the former zoning boundary was that was initially proposed to go to two family from single where we're recommending based on, you know, topographic and uh, really mobility challenges in that area to uh, leave that as single family and not uh, recommend converting it to the two family. This picture probably helps um, with your getting your sense of direction and sense of boundary. This was that a large area northwest of Norwalk Hospital. Um, again, Norwalk Hospital is in its own zone, which isn't the kind of <clears throat> greenish teal color down through here. Um, initially, this area within this red, uh, very odd shaped polygon was proposed to go to two family. We've scaled that back. There is additional two family proposed north of there. Um, as well as additional two family proposed in the area to the south. And then we have increased the buffer where the, this multifamily is allowed. Um, and you know, what's interesting with this area is it kind of has that confluence of the, you know, the, the route one corridor plus the hospital. Um, and there are some other employers in this area as well. So that's why the, the boundary lines kind of laid out the where they are. This area right now is a mix of, you know, it's predominantly two family through a lot of that area. There is some multifamily and a lot of these streets, it's kind of probably some of the most jumbled parts of the zoning in the city where you go from um, multifamily building to two family building, occasionally a single, but most of the time it's two or multi. So we kind of, we think we came up with a good boundary line or good distinction line through this area. That, that make a little more sense than looking at it from the small scale? Yes, I think so. Okay. And I'll jump back to the harbor after, um, but I, I'll focus this, this screen gives a good shot of the, the areas we talked to, the other areas we talked about. Um, starting on the right, this was, uh, this is Golden Hill, was initially recommended to go to uh, this purple multifamily color, but uh, recommending now to leave it as two family, um, where the area is further to the west. Following again, this red outline was the previous boundary of the proposed two family, but we've now recommended um, taking this area and, and the area up through here and putting it into the two family, basically because there's better um, public access through these points to the employment centers, um, either to the east or to the north. And then jumping um, jumping 95 in Route 1, this area through here, which was predominantly single family zone, um, you know, if just, just if you kind of, this is a good shot to kind of get a sense of what we were thinking about with those quarter mile and half mile buffers. You can see, um, you know, if you can follow along with the cursor, here's Route 1 that kind of you know, flows southeast, southwest to northeast through um, western part of the city. Um, immediately abutting that, and this is the existing zoning boundary, is the business number one and business number two zone, which now moves into the new 4C category. Um, and then if you really apply that buffer, that's when you start getting that uh, multifamily, dropping it down to the one or two family, and then dropping it again to single. Through this stretch through here, it was really a double jump going from single to multi. So we've recommended <clears throat> to revert it back or to um, scale it back, I should say, to the one or two family versus the multi. And I think that kind of makes sense. Um, and again, over time, should the city's needs change, you, th this boundary can change and then it changes with the needs of the community going forward. What neighborhood is that that you just outlined? Let me 
bump into, I don't know if it's got a specific designation, but I'll bump in, bump it up so you can see the street names a little bit better. Yeah. It's sort of West Norwalk by the community college. JJ. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's over by NCC, right? Right. Yeah, yes. That's TV is NCC. So you're downgrading that back down, that down to one to two family? So right now it's all single. Um, it's all single. It, it's proposed to go to one or two. Okay. It was a double chart. It was going to the small multifamily or the neighborhood business. You're, you're bringing it back because it was a double jump and you think it should be a single jump. Is that That's it? That's another way to think about it, yeah. Okay. But you have this huge employment center, which is NCC, and you want to bring more people in, more students, more, 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 more um, teaching professor, professionals. Where are they going to live? Well, so so now technically, I mean, you know, and this is not my argument, but an argument other people have made. So if these are all today, um, and, and we can pull up another map, I think that has what the actual uses are on those properties. But just for um, discussion purposes, if these are all single family today, the rezoning would allow them to become two families. So technically, you're you're increasing density uh, possibility within that area. Oh, okay. I just I just want to have an entry point for, you know, working um, working professionals to be able to buy a house where they work, you know, close to where they work, and you know this is a great neighborhood, but if it's already zoned for just single family, they'll never be able to afford it. I, I agree. Yeah, that's why I think at least for now, I think you know if you go from the single only and then allow potentially allow two family, you are you are moving in that direction of achieving the goal you just talked about. Thank you. Okay. Steve, do we have any data on where people actually live and work like in, along route one or how many people that work at the hospital actually live in Norwalk or in the school system? I mean, do we have any kind of data about that? Not that specific. The census data doesn't get that granular. Um, it does more, you know, area wide. So you might get a sense of, okay, X number of Norwalk residents uh, work in Stanford or commute to the city or right. work within the city, but they don't necessarily, you know, we, we, we could probably, and I don't think we can do it in a, in a short time period, we could, you know, see, you know, working through uh, NCC or the hospital to get that information if they would provide it. Mm -hmm. But I don't, but, it, but it's not like, that's not like publicly available data. Right, right? no, it's it's private information. information. Yeah, I was just curious, thank you. Yeah, that's no, a good question. I mean, I, I think that's something we could think about a little bit longer term too. Right. Do we also have yeah. any data or any way to find out how many two family houses are, owner occupied I think a lot of them probably are you know where people buy a house with uh, I think Brian may have uh, Brian do you have that I don't know if you've got it from the last time yeah you I don't have it readily available but I do have that data and I could forward that out to the commission um and it, I, I mean it's based on so what we did was um we looked at all the two family houses in Norwalk and then matched up their um street address with their billing address um, might not be like 100% accurate, but I think it gives a rough enough uh, idea of what uh, is going on, whether they're owner occupied or not. Okay. But I can forward that out to the commission. To yeah, that's, sense. I think we'd be surprised how many are owner occupied. But, you know, I don't know, obviously. We should at least base it on the actual data, not yes, exactly. each individual yeah. person's sense of what tends to happen in two family houses. Right. No, no, no. That's why I asked. You I agree. Know, Thank you. Actual data. <laughs> There's a distinction between a multifamily house and whether you own it as a as a condo or like not. You know, there could be a two family house, but somebody could own the whole thing, or two people could own the distinct halves, and then it becomes a condo. So right. it's not an exact science if you're going to measure it that way. Like if you have a condominium complex like Ledgebrook, okay, you know everybody in there. Well, basically, everybody owns their own condo. They might not live in it. They might rent it. But those are clearly condominiums. But there are a lot of houses that were built in Norwalk in the 60s that are cut in half. And one person owns one side and one person owns the other side. But a multifamily house in general, the owner owns the whole thing. And then they live in one part and rent out the other unit or units. Right. 
we want to get the distinction between the two families where both are both units are rented versus one is owner occupied and the other was is rented and that's what cross referencing with the billing information can get us is that correct yeah it'll at least tell you so usually if it's um like two one person owns one unit and another person owns the other unit usually they're broken up so to, like the property has two billing addresses so there's like a unit a and a unit b um and then it, it the the like cross reference of the billing address with the street address um it, it might not tell you if each unit is owner occupied but it will tell you that if the owner lives on the property or not so maybe they own they own either both units and rent out the other um or uh you know a, a situation more like that um this is the devil's garden area through here again the red outline was where the previous uh, zoning map draft zoning map had designated the area as a two uh, proposed for two family um and the the, the newest uh, version is recommending that it will remain single i think that area is pretty self-explanatory what was the justification what was the reason um this one was a little you know i i think was a little bit more of a stretch on our part in terms of you know, part of the justification was proximity to Brian McMahon. We, there is some increases in the two family right in and around there, but I think we it was probably a little bit more of a stretch to say that um, it, it was needed as much in that area because it's a little further away from some of the other um, employment centers in and around the area. Does it make sense to make row eight and woods because it's a condominium, a different color? Like, do you make it orange? instead of the yellow because it's uh that we'd have to change the zone for it then at that point because it that was approved as part of a i think it's, it was a pud from a long time ago oh, okay um, okay hey, what I, is the train station down there at right now so the train station and initially and we took a hard look at the train station and i losing my bearings here um we had taken a look at uh this area right through here to does it make sense to put it in the two family zone? The, the issue with this area is the, and I think from that standpoint, yeah, you're near a train station, you could uh, support some more density. The the issue with this area is the the width of the width, widths, I'm sorry, losing my speech at this late hour. The width of the lot would probably end up where you go from a density today of, you know, one lot, uh, one unit per lot to potentially having subdivision and then end up with uh, a two family plus a two family on what, what is today a single lot. So we thought that was a big jump from the current zoning. One thing I think could that I'd like to explore a little bit more in this area, um, and if you get a chance, take a look at the POCD, it talks about uh, as a concept like cottage communities which is kind of similar to what we did on that approval on Richards Avenue, uh, yep. which I think something like that and some of these properties might make sense over the long term because these are a little bit isolated from the rest of the other. Um, yeah, that would be great. But I think something like that could actually work over here. So that's something I'm going to try to take another look at over the next couple of yeah, weeks. Yeah, that would be awesome because this feels a little bit inconsistent with um, all the other train stations. and. Yeah, so but it's, it's totally residential, unlike the South Norwalk train station. And Tammy, we're talking about duplexes and two people homes versus for saying I'm 10 people here. Like there's a housing crisis in this in this state, in this country. I don't know. I'm just I hear you. It's different. But like, I think life is different and cities evolve and we need to evolve. The cottage right? community thing is that something that can be done in 3S or 3? Um, let me take a look because I don't want to give you the wrong answer. I can't remember what zoning district it lined up in because um, it was called, uh, I think Brian, correct me if you recall, it, don't correct me if I'm wrong or correct me if I'm wrong if you remember, I should say. I think it was called like an elderly housing okay. development. I think that's what we call senior housing development. And it was basically... It was kind of like a uh, conservation subdivision light 
where we um, allowed folks to cluster the dwelling units um, closer together. Um, but you know, the one thing with some of those properties was where it doesn't line up perfectly is that there was conservation value on some of the properties and there was like a water course in the back. So we got a larger um, buffer area than we normally would allow and then more open space. So that might not lend itself perfectly to this, but maybe something conceptually along those lines could, could work. But it would take somebody with a lot of imagination to kind of pull all that together in terms of an actual development though. But I think it's something worth, definitely worth looking at. I have a question, Mike, here. The um, PUD, as you described, Rowaiton Woods, way back when, is that still a designation in our code? I haven't seen that phrase. I know we have conservation development, but we don't have, do we have a PUD designate, uh, uh, definition? Not in the draft, <laughs> excuse me, not in the draft regulations. And it, but the old designation, was that allowed almost anywhere in the city, uh, I guess, by special permit? It was allowed in certain zones, and I don't remember exactly which ones at the top of my head, but then there's a very, the language around that is very strange, the way they kind of, like they froze it in the regulations, which was like very odd way to mm -hmm. word things, so. Did it have to have a certain amount of acreage? Yeah, there were specific requirements in and around that as well, but it just the way it was put together was just kind of a little bit dysfunctional, dysfunctional, I should say. Well, I remember the development up on Chestnut Hill in Cranberry, um, almost uh, in Wilton, uh, near that near that line, mm -hmm. uh, you know, way up north. Yeah, uh, that's a conservation subdivision, that one. That's a little bit different. All right. Okay. So that, and that increased density in a single family zone uh, and I think preserved half the property or whatever in uh, in meadow uh, I remember that when when that was approved you know, eight yeah years there, there, there's some pluses and minuses to that I mean it's nice that the land is conserved but it there was never really a good like there's not a public access mechanism built into that so it's almost like a private, park in the back there. So, I mean, yeah. there, there's pluses to it, but I don't think it's was ever structured quite well either. Right. Okay. Thanks. So yep. Steve, I, I have a question that may not be, um, I heard a complaint that, you know, in the AAA zones, instead of requiring an acre, they, they, they were going to measure the lots by, you know, how much frontage, setbacks, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they're all single family. This is in West Norwalk. Um, it seems to me you come up with the same result basically without requiring acreage. I don't see how that's going to result in much more density. Am I right about that? Yeah, and Brian would be able to speak to this better because he's been tasked with running all kinds of scenarios and numbers based off of that. Um, we, we do think you're, we, you know, we, we put a provision in the regulations to require a lot circle width. Um, and Brian's thinking might maybe we'd have like a, you know, that that lot width has to be maintained for like 75% of the lot or something like that. But we actually looked at that um, and there's really no, the numbers are very small. The only areas where someone could potentially add additional lots is if they have like a corner property. So they have a lot of width on, you know, they have multiple streets of width. So that uh -huh. could lead to some lots, but the numbers of the, considering the number of AAA parcels is really small. Brian, I don't know if you want to elaborate more on that. Yeah, because like so many of the properties in the AAA zone are not an acre, as a matter of fact, you know, they would, they were developed before that zoning and their grandfather did. My house is not an acre and it's in a, you know, it's about a half an acre and it's in a triple A zone. So, you know, there's certainly no regularity as it is. Yeah, I think we maybe lost Brian for a little bit, but um, yeah, we, we can provide that information as well. We were asked to take a, a hard look at that and we've been running those numbers and we don't think it's it's an issue. And especially if we put in that added language about the lot circle, I think that kind of 
takes the whole thing off the table at that point. Okay. And, and the reason that that change was made, um, and that's consistent throughout the regulations, is that uh, you, no one really can tell how big of a lot, a lot there is unless you're kind of looking at it from an aerial view. What you perceive when you're walking by or driving by is how wide the property is. So you, you get a sense of if there's a fence or a hedge line, okay, that's where it looks like the property line might be. This person's property is here. Their house is located, you know, whatever number of feet away it is from the property line. And then the same thing happens on the other yard. But you really don't know how deep a lot is or what that translates into in terms of area. So it's kind of a, a an unnecessary metric. Right, right. Um, so just moving further east, this, uh, again, we talked about this gives a little better. I know I was zoomed in probably a little too much on those slides, so I apologize for that. This is um, Shorefront Park, and this is on Seaview in East Norwalk, where the existing zoning for both of these areas um, are is currently B residents, which is single family. And we had proposed to put them into this um, orange CD3, which for one sense, they're both already surrounded by that two family zoning, but there are you know, unique characteristics in these areas um, that kind of lend itself to, to um, leaving them in the single family zone. So staff doesn't have a big uh, big issue with them uh, retaining single family zoning. <clears throat> what are the unique characteristics? Um, I think first and foremost, like a lot of this is, um, there are private deed restrictions related to these areas as well. Um, there are older homes in some of these areas, more give it a little more um, historic value in terms of properties in, in other parts that are surrounding it. Uh, so I think that would probably be the main uh, justification. What do you mean and by private deed restrictions? There are, um, you know, I think when the, you know, there's homeowners associations, other things that when these properties were established that went along with that in terms of, um, I think even the deed restriction indicates that it can be single family zoning over. Now, single family zoning only, that would not be something the city would be bound by if we changed it, but that would be something that the, the homeowners of that area um, would have to enforce if, if somebody decided to put up a two family or something like that. So by if if this were to go to CD3 as planned and somebody decided to try to do two family, the HOA would have to go through the expense of suing and maybe they would win or maybe they wouldn't, but it's a pain in the tuchus. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would definitely, I mean, I, I think they could technically try to get an injunction against the permit. I had no idea I'd have to talk to a land use attorney to see what you know, I'm sure there's been court cases on something like that in the past. I don't know what yeah. the success rate of something like that would be. Okay. And so what's the unique situation with the one over in East Norwalk? I think the key thing with this area over here is lot size versus um, what happens to the, if you can see my cursor to the Northeast of that, which a lot of is already, um, I think mostly uh, one and two family zoning now. Um, those are, you know, you can see, let me zoom in a little bit too. So these neighborhoods through here, um, you know, they're on a much tighter grid pattern in terms of how they're laid out. Very, you know, obviously very rectangular lots. Um, whereas these for the most part are much larger lots and just have a different characteristic than the ones to the Northeast. And these over here are kind of, I would say, excuse me, by and large are more similar to what's happening um, to the South, which is the, uh, are also single family. They're all like 10th of an acre zoning over there. Yeah, they, they look still they're pretty small. Same. Yeah, they're all small. Like, and then the, geographically, is, the cutoff was that little river, you know, the little inlet there by Hawkins. Yeah, and these the lots are, the are larger than most of these lots for sure. Yeah, Seaside Place, because they're old. All of those, most of those houses were built in the late 1800s along there, and they have a very unique characteristic. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I think I called it Seaview before. Sorry, Seaside. 
sure about that. <laughs> and the lots over like between Ludlow and Gregory, those look a little bigger than the ones between, you know, Gregory and Cove. But yeah, those ones aren't those, going 3S. I didn't realize like, like the lot size was the determining factor so much. Not always, uh, you know, it just depends on area by area that way. I think these is already existing um, two family though. I'll double check that, but I, I don't have that map up, but I think it is. No, it's B to CD3. That one is B to CD3? Okay. Yeah. And yeah, Staples no, Court too. An argument could be made, Ludlow and Staples uh, section should just be CD3S like Pine Hill next door because there is a unique uh, character. And you, and you know what was very helpful was the map that Anna had asked for earlier, the, you know, the new one, which is the uh, density increase map. You guys, the you guys, the staff had um, very helpfully put all the two families in dark purple. Uh, do you remember that, Anna? With uh, you know, I'm staring at it. Yes, and, on a and, big monitor, right? Now. Oh, good. Well, you'll you'll confirm. Yeah, there's no that, two. Fa there's one two family in the. That's what you're saying. That there's no two yeah, families so, in the Pine Hill. Yeah. And if you go across Gregory, you would see more see than a half, lot of two families, more than half the houses in the uh, second, third, fourth, fifth neighborhood are two family, more than half. But then it, it drops to zero on the other side of Gregory, mm -hmm. which is, would be an argument. I would say, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I see both sides of the need and the need uh, to preserve, you know, some neighborhood stability where people don't worry that uh, something is gonna be redeveloped right next door to them. So, and Ludlow has, is, is, is a historic neighborhood. It's a, you know, that was, I mentioned it in one of our meetings recently, it was a streetcar neighborhood, but that was developed, you know, 1920s, uh, 1910 to 1930 really. So over like 20 years, all those houses are kind of similar um, and, but I, I would, I could see an argument being made to take Staples and Ludlow and just take those out of the CD3 there. I'm sure there's other pit places as well, but I'm, I'm just looking at, looking at that, um, the existing two families and, uh, using that as a, as a cue. Yeah. So I wonder about that because, I mean, I can see that argument. I can also see the argument that there's plenty of houses in the district that's already zoned C nearby, like just north of Staples Court, that also were built around that same time. My house is 1923. There's there's tons of them. Like it's not like the old ones are on Ludlow. They're they're all over. And that if we're looking to expand the opportunity to do two family for those who would wish to do so, we should be looking to expand it to the areas that don't have a lot of current two families already. Yes, I like am. If, I'm, on my, I'm on my other I'm, screen. I'm not, so. Yeah, I uh, don't have an opinion about that, except that I was looking at the maps and looking at what had already been developed uh, into two family. And yeah. the, the zone seemed to be following a lot of that and then I see I, it's like a little sliver of the current uh, B you know stretches up on Ludlow and Staples if you look at the existing map yeah. it is it is one of these kind of odd shaped uh, uh, zones that the new zoning rewrite is trying to to help solve but you know so I, I'm just throwing this out there that I, I just I noticed that that was an up zone of an area that didn't have traditional two family. Yeah, agreed. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, so I mean, again, if, if this was give us some direction, if you want us to pull that back, that's, you know, we're, again, it's, it's your, your call on those things. Well, I, a lot, we're gonna hear a lot. I, I have, first of all, I have to commend the staff for listening in all the meetings that you've been to. And um, I, you know, and I, and I think a re this response, this uh, revision is uh, 
commendable. And uh, but there's certainly more feedback that we are, we are going to continue to listen. And uh, so I was just throwing that out there. That's something that I noticed uh, about uh, East Norwalk right there. And so I just have a, just one additional question in regards to impact. So I, I understand the tweaking that, you know, you're proposing, but is, is this tweaking going to happen citywide or this just going to be targeted tweaking between, you know, people who have, you know, political voice? No, because I think we did. Um, so, sorry, I'm, this, the map is not being very friendly at the moment. Um, so I can tell you, I don't think like just looking at where we're at in the screen here, I don't think I got one call or inquiry from anybody in this area um, and, and on conversations with council folks in this area, they didn't have any opposition to the proposed upzoning we had there initially. Um, so this was taken out just because we're trying to be more consistent with what we've been talking about in terms of the quarter mile and half mile buffers. And I think, you know, when you zoom out, might have illustrated a little bit more. So that those red kind of large outline areas, I think we we reverted back areas throughout the city. So this was like the one of the only areas that was really far north up near because it outside of the train station, there's not as much. So we we pulled that back. Um, and then the areas that so I think like this area around the hospital probably had the most change in terms of um, uh, existing land use to proposed land use. So we we scaled that back and then we we tried to provide more consistent buffers in and around um, what we had talked about in Route 1. And then same thing in uh, East Norwalk and in the area near um, near City Hall. So we, you know, it, from this vantage point, I think it helps illustrate it a little bit more. Um, well, will this tweaking provide more housing or less? Oh, well, yeah, if, if, if you revert it from two family to one family, it, it's going to technically lessen it, but you can still, you know, the other argument would be you can still do ADUs on these single families. Let me let me let me say a couple of uh, a, a couple of things. First of all, I think uh, to um, have this process go uh, as smoothly as possible and to uh, reduce unnecessary stress on the public, we ought to accept this current draft. Um, as uh, the draft we're going to work with going going forward into the public hearings. That doesn't mean that this becomes the final map. It's simply now the new map that we work with as we move toward um, resolving all as, as many of these uh, issues as it's possible uh, to. Um, and I, I, <clears throat> I think the community will be more comfortable with it. Um, it will um, make, I, th it, I think it will make the public hearings more useful to us because we've gotten um, uh, the, de the decisions that the staff is, has made to this point seems to me whether you agree with them or not, they're rational. They can be justified. Uh, I think they're reasonable and still represent good planning for the city. Um, and so it will remove a lot of the background noise that nobody needs um, as, as we move this forward. But the second and, and, and most important point and this really goes to the issue that JJ raised. Um, final decision on what the map is going to be, on what the zoning is going to be, rests with us. It doesn't rest with the mayor. It doesn't rest with the council. Uh, it doesn't rest with other politicians in the city. That final decision is ours and, and ours alone. Um, and I think it's it's important to remember that. 
Thank you, Lou. And I, I agree. I think it's a good idea to just accept this as the new draft to, to work from. I did have a question about our sort of deliberations in July and August following the public hearings. Would it be something where, okay, we've, okay, here's our draft map. Here's the public hearings. We look at all the comments that uh, staff's going to upload to the site and all of that. And like, I make a motion. I think this 10 black area should be this instead of this all in favor on that change. And it's sort of like one by one. Is, is that what this is going to look like or? It, it could. I would hope that we could do a lot of this, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it by a consensus and 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 just deal with the real what what we consider as a commission, the really sticky stuff where where we can't all agree, deal with with those issues in in the way you're suggesting. Actually, if we need to go to a vote. Um, and then we have a document when we go to a public a public hearing in the fall um, that um, I mean, a, a kind of kind of like what was just done with the debt ceiling. Um, to some some hopefully to small degree, we all hold our nose and and uh, prove something that uh, may not be perfect from our point of view, but from the commission's point of view as an organization is as good uh, as we can make it. Agreed. So, yeah, I mean, we're gonna have two um, uh, fairly long nights uh, ahead of us. And in fact, one of the things we could discuss right now is um, do we wanna set a time limit? Um, you know, do we want to say the, the uh, on speakers or the night? No, uh, I think on the night, you know, are we going to end at 10 o'clock um, or are we going to go later? Are we going to start earlier? Because is it possible that that public hearing could be the only one on the agenda? Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> from what I understand from Steve, no. So, no. Have, no. We have some business we have to conduct. Yeah, it's not a public hearing, but we do have um, a referral from uh, other city agencies regarding the three Belden city purchase. You have a timeline in which you have to act on that. So that is completely out of my hands. I can't tell them no. Sorry, I have zero authority there. So can I was going to suggest do a special meeting then. Yeah, well, that, so the option is you could do a special meeting before the 21st. Um, if you wanted to do the, next week, I haven't talked to them if see if they could do that. Um, or you start at like 5.30 on the 21st, have a special meeting. You don't need to have everybody there. Some people can't make it. As long as you have a quorum, you can probably take action on those items um, and then set the public hearing for this at like, six o'clock or 6.30 and go to 10.30. Um, I think, you know, you do have something else to think about. You don't have to decide it tonight because as the chairman mentioned earlier, we're working on the venue because ideally, I, I, you know, the easiest room is to do it in the council chambers. I don't know if it's going to be big enough for that crowd. So we'd like to do it in the community room, but they had some audio problems in there. So they're, we're working on that today. I don't know if they got that rectified. Um, you do have the ability, though, to place a time limit on speakers to say you have three minutes, and then once everybody's had a chance to speak, we'll allow anybody who wants to come up again and make additional comments. I don't know if that's going to be better or worse to get get people in and out one time, but that I, I, that is something you guys could contemplate doing. Um, for in, in my so, short experience with the commission, it's that's never enforced. Well, if we have it, though, it, it, you know, we cut down the 20 minute, you know, thing. And I think we can. Uh, I'm not concerned about enforcement. I don't mind cutting people off. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what we need to do. Yeah, we've got we I think a time limit is super important because we end up with these 20 minute half hour speeches. You know, God forbid someone comes in with a PowerPoint. 
that has happened. Well, they repeat you know, exactly. yeah. it's it's more the duplication, the yeah. That. Right. Exactly, JJ. Yeah. That's the thing that takes up a lot of the time too. I'm not against the time limit idea, but I think given the scope of changes proposed and that the public hearing is not just about the zoning map changes, right? There's reorganizing it to be a better document, which hopefully everybody likes, but you know, and then there's switching it to form based. And then there's the changes that cover lots of different areas. I think if we do a limit, it should be more like five or eight minutes or something. <laughs> just right. well, that'll be fine. Just so long, you know, so people can express, you know, a lot of times when we have these very long comments, the ideas could be expressed in five minutes if that's all they had to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if there's a way. I don't want to make it so people can't say what they think, but I do want to make it so that we don't have to sit through long, long, basically irrelevant. Right. I don't know if well, there's it's a, a matter. matter of, it's a matter of courtesy to all the speakers. That's that's the yeah. problem. If you're if you're you arrive late, you didn't get your name up on the sign-in sheet, which has happened to me, and the meeting is shut down. Then you are basically. Uh, you don't have a voice. You're not. You're not, and and I have stood behind people who've spoken for 20 minutes, and just had them say we were out of time, and you're like, well, if they only spoke for five minutes, we would have had three other people able to speak. So it really is a matter of courtesy to everyone else because you know, it, it, yeah. I mean, you write down your comments and you read them. I usually go a minute over what I think I am going to, but. Just the way well, I volunteer to be the timekeeper. But will you have a cane? <laughs> That's the question. I, no, I, I, I'll, I'll have my watch. I'll have my <laughs> Apple phone and I'll just, you know, put it on timer. And when they get, I'll signal when they're getting close to the end and, you know, play music as they leave. I uh, think if we go to like five or eight minutes, just reinforcing, like, if you have something to say that's longer than that, we still want to hear it. Submit it as a written comment. I'm sure right. you already have. There are also those of us who don't process information orally as well as in writing. Mm -hmm. um, and so like a 20 minute speech, I, I don't know. I think it's better. It, it may be better received in writing. It certainly could be right. also received in writing. Right. So I, I like the idea of a three to five minute limit that we monitor it and enforce it and this way allow the next person to speak. And hopefully everyone who wants to speak in that room will get an opportunity to do so. That will be great. And at the same time, we can get home before midnight. Well, I think we should do both. I think we should also <laughs> cap it at like 10 o'clock too, because I think our brain yeah, yeah. is shutting down irregardless and then it's just chatter. True, uh, true. And then, right, and then yeah. Steve, are we gonna get the, the written okay feedback by then as well yeah i if we if brian and i can stick to our schedule we want to get that to you by next friday that's our gotcha. our plan uh, you know i think it's kind of what picking up on what uh, uh, anna was saying i think a lot i think a lot of the comments you know the the real concern negative comments have been uh, re regarding the upzoning so i i mean to me i know people want to express their opinion but if someone objects to going from single family to two family, I don't think that takes more than a minute to say that. I mean, I don't think there's nothing really more to say than don't change the zone on my property. Um, I think then you guys have to decide whether it was too aggressive or not too aggressive on those kind of things. I don't think, you know, what else there is to say. I think there might be more substantive conversations about, um, you know, the 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 going form based versus not going form based and why somebody thinks it's a bad idea that that's a more in depth kind of conversation to build around but I don't know if there's a way to like from from your perspective to kind of you know when somebody says I object to the changing my zoning from one to two that you say okay I heard you we'll look at every property and every street to make sure that it's you know the right uh, designation going forward. Uh, uh, Steve, I wanted to just ask you if the concert hall was available we did a, have a zoning meeting in there once maybe more than once but i remember it was on the uh famous mosque uh in west norwalk and uh we switched you know we had the 
table up on the stage with the commission and then oh, great. Uh, and and actually fit you know obviously fits a lot of people so uh that's that's something to look into and I'm, i don't know about the recording but i think i think they're they should be geared up for recording because they record concerts in there all the time so um anyway yeah, i've reserved both rooms i've reserved the community room and the concert hall oh. um Whatever IT says they can do is where I'll go. I mean, that, oh, so okay. I didn't know you had you had considered the concert hall. I didn't hear that. Yeah, I, I was thinking ahead for once. So, now, Steve, right. I, I, hybrid, or will it be? Yes, it's it's going to have to be hybrid because we, you know, initially, um, from my perspective, and I get the other side. And to me, I think it's more efficient to run it virtually. Personally, I think it's more effective that way, and everybody has more, you know, time to speak, and it's just more efficient. But uh, you know, and people made the request to do it in person, so we'll honor that request. Um, but at this point, we couldn't couldn't just do in person. Okay, so the commissioners, some will be there in person, some will be there virtually, right? That's your call on how you want to do that. <clears throat> you mean as individuals? Which the information that was sent out about those two meetings implied that it was virtual, so that needs to be corrected. Because yeah, the I, flyer said virtual. Right. I got a post, I got two postcards, and they both said it was a Zoom meeting. Yeah, that's what the intent was to do it in Zoom. But we have no choice once yeah. someone requests that it be in person, then it has to be hybrid. Like by default, our meetings are on Zoom. The meeting gets scheduled, the agenda gets published, or in this case, a notice goes out. And then if somebody says, I want to participate on site, you make it available and if 20 people say i want to participate on site or whatever number you say oh we need to get a room right it only requires one person and right steve so you wouldn't, with us. Well, you wouldn't get the concert hall for one person no right? no no we, but like one person makes it hybrid but right. if you get a, a good number of people saying they want to come then you start saying okay this is going to be a thing so at the point that you sent out the notice you don't know if people are requesting that. Right. right. Okay, so, so all this time that we've been having Zoom meetings, some one member of the public could have said, I request that the Planning and Zoning Commission meet in person and we would have to. That's what happened no. on the cemetery. They can my understanding from the statute is it's not that they request that the Planning and Zoning Commission meet in person. Yeah, they request that they have an on-person way to participate in the virtual meeting because not everybody has zoom equipment at home and some people like hanging out in a public space right so if one person asks for that you put them in a room in city hall and you give them the zoom equipment and if x number of people ask for that you say we need a bigger room and you know we want to see if other commissioners are also going to come in on person to set up the ipads yeah i think that's how it works I yeah. can tell you that I won't be there on the 28th. <laughs> I'll be out of state. But I'll try to be there on the 21st. I can. So um, are, are, right. we, are we are we proposing that the 28th be the special meeting? Because I'm gonna my calendar's right here. No, yeah, right. The 28th at, is the oh. meeting. Yeah. 21st and the, the 28th. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I have the 21st already marked. So I'm gonna right. mark the 28th as well. Okay, thank and you. And the second one is the 28th. And they're both in person. Time, in time and location to be determined. determined. Okay. Uh, they're going to be hybrid meetings. I'll make sure that I'm at City Hall. Um, you know, last question on scheduling. What about starting at like 530? We don't need everybody there. If you can't make it, that's okay. Just need a quorum to do the other business. And that if it runs till 630, what we were thinking about doing, the technically we'll set up the 530 meeting is a special meeting. If it runs past six o'clock, we could have the other one start at six and people will just start to come in at six o'clock and then they just have to, you know, wait, wait till you guys get done with the business and then we'll kick off the public hearing on the, the rewrite. That's, that that's sounds fine like with me as, as long as you understand that uh, that may require us to take two breaks instead of one. <laughs> um, Yay! <laughs> now, I'm personally fine with an 11 p.m. cutoff uh, instead of 10, if that's an. I am number. as well. 
you know, I mean, I, I'm a night person anyway, and I know we all have different responsibilities and I'm lucky I don't have children, but uh, I, <laughs> I didn't mean it like that, but uh, <laughs> I didn't mean it to sound that way. In the fact that I have, have children. No, um, uh, you know what I meant. I, mean, I, that's fine. I just have a dog <laughs> late to go out. So, uh, but anyway, uh, it's easy, 11 o'clock. I mean, midnight, that's, um, you know, that's, oh, I have to give, we've, have have, to we've had many meetings till midnight, but I, I think that's I mean, too I, I know, I, I mean, I literally have to be at the office the next day early. So 10 o'clock, 10.30, the very latest, so I can be back home by 11. Hey, let, let, let me and uh, uh, Steve uh, talk about that and come up with uh, sometime between 10 and 11 um, when, we'll, when we'll end the meeting. Yeah. Uh, if we go as late as 11, I think we definitely will take two breaks um, so that we can stay as fresh as possible. Yeah, it's hard to listen. It's certainly going to be a two coke night for me. We'll uh, we'll bring in some refreshments for the we'll leave since if we do it in either one of the rooms, food, you're right by. I'll well, stay. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking of the public who you know will all you know they'll have planned around it and and I think you know I we're we want to listen and we want to hear as many members of the public. This is right. so important. So 10:30 might be a good compromise, JJ. Right? I mean, you, thank you, could, you. Yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll keep the time. <laughs> and and the reason why I suggested, oh, I'm sorry, Chapin, if you were about to uh, start, but the reason why I think I I'm fine with 11 is because we have uh, heard complaints about people not even liking our meetings starting at six o'clock because they feel like it's too early and that they they're just coming in or they're still stuck in traffic or they're doing something for their family. So I, that's why I think you know 11 o'clock, and historically different uh, boards and commissions have run later. Not saying that that is something that we want to do. Well, it's now 1050. So I think yeah. we, we ought to, um, we have two more items. Uh, approval of the minutes of uh, May 17th. Motion to approve. Uh, Tammy, I saw Tammy and I saw Nick. Uh, uh, all in favor? All right. Approved your name. Um, uh, comments of the director. Anything else, Steve, you need to bring up? I'll rem if I remember, I'll email you, but I don't think so. Okay, good. Comments of commissioners? Good. Um, this is a tough one. Motion to adjourn? <laughs> all right. Well, all the hands went up, so we're mm -hmm. adjourned. Be well, everyone. Have a good couple of weeks. See you on the 21st. Good night. Good night. Good night.